Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Ellensburg, Washington, USA. You're looking live out the window of Discovery Hall on the first floor. This is the campus of Central Washington University, and it's trying to decide to snow a little bit. It's trying, kind of indecisive weather, but here we are in late February, and we still have a bit of snow with us. It's a sleepy Sunday morning here at the headquarters of Ice Age Floods A to Z. And I welcome you. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the office, room 134 of Discovery Hall. Thank you so much for being part of this series all along and for being with us here for the last episode. The local time is 8.48 in the morning and today's date is Sunday, February 18th, 2024. I hope everything's going well with you I sincerely hope that. And if you're watching this in replay and you're new to us, you can scrub ahead. You can fast forward probably 15 minutes to the beginning of today's episode. But in these first 12 minutes or so, I'm talking live to people around the world who are tuning in and being with us. We have approaching 500 live viewers, and that will probably double in the next 10, 15 minutes as per usual. Where are you viewing from today? Can I say hi to a number of you? I've got a couple quick thank yous. I want to test something quickly with you before we start. And then I will uh, send out the Zoom invite to our guests, plural. Renee says, good morning from Memphis, Tennessee. James is in Ording, Washington. John, Carol, where are you viewing from, everybody? Fraser River, British Columbia, Columbia, Missouri, Fairbanks, Alaska. Good morning from San Diego, California. Oh, boy. San Francisco, California, Jarrett, Virginia, Frisco, Texas, which is a suburb of Dallas. Bob uh, clarifies for us. Nina is in Norway. Adventure Sombrata is in Waikile, Hawaii. Good morning. Hooper, Utah. Kirk is in Sweden. Rogue Valley, Oregon. Pocatello. Hello, Mr. Morlock. Do we know each other? I'm not sure I recognize your name. There's Ken in Sandpoint, uh, Sandpoint, Idaho. Thank you for all your help this winter, Ken. Uh, A different Bob is in Kamloops, B.C. John's in Houston, Texas. East Lansing, Michigan. Lincoln City, Oregon. Rochester, New York. Whidbey Island, Washington. Cincinnati, Ohio. Buckley, Washington, Victoria, British Columbia. There's Glenn. Glenn in Liberty Lake, a.k.a. Glenn in Spokane, a.k.a. Google Earth by Glenn. Good morning, Glenn. Cologne, Germany. Hello, Geneva. It's 48 degrees there. Uh, Fahrenheit, I guess, huh? Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Happy Valley, Oregon. Fresno. Oh, no. East of Fresno, California. Thank you. Evergreen, Colorado, Webb Lake, Wisconsin, Uh, Cheryl, there's Cheryl, the reference librarian. Uh, Thank you, Cheryl, for all of your help. Cheryl's checking in from Spokane, although she spent her working days down in Pullman at Washington State University. Paul's in Vancouver. Everybody's thanking Glenn. Stefano is in Italy. Hello, Stefano. Do we have a few other exotic locations before I do a couple quick thank yous? Getting greedy this morning on a Sunday. Uh, I'll wait for a couple. Oh, we have uh, Sankalp is in Rishikesh, India. Hello. Hey, great to have you with us today. Thank you for joining us. Hello from North America. And Hamlin, Germany. Looking for more exotic stuff now that I'm just greedy. Uh, Or at least outside the States. There's Janet in, in Penticton, B.C., and Newton, Iowa, uh, Pineapple Express, California, that's Oscar uh, joshing us. Okay, Budapest, yeah, yeah, 
Zoltan, Budapest is exotic enough. You qualify. Congratulations. Glasgow, Scotland. And there's your score on 3rd Avenue in Ellensburg, Washington. Good morning, Jordan. Okay, let's do a few quick thank yous. Thank you to Dale, who sent this beautiful little uh, uh, atlas of the Rathdrum Prairie. Um, and uh, I promise, uh, Dale, uh, that I will use this and get very interested uh, to the point where I've been, I definitely plan on making some field videos over in the Spokane area in the next few months. So thank you for that, Dale. Kristen uh, decided to get creative and say, uh, rock on rock differentiation. But darling, don't you know, granite is the scum of the earth. This is at the home of the basalts. But mom, I love him. Thank you, Kristen. And he goes to docky the document camera uh, for the last quick thank you this morning. Uh, Michael in Janesville, Wisconsin has been very creative and he's got a printer and he's not afraid to use it. And so Michael knows enough about me that I need directions because I'm not that bright. So Michael sent a poster of the state of Washington in pieces. This is the same guy that last winter uh, for uh, session Z of the Baja BC series. Uh, created this mobile, basically, of all the guests uh, from last winter's uh, series. It included Bijou as well. Pull my tail. So Michael Guest uh, visit, students that visit my office always notice this first and they always ask about it, so thank you. So Michael uh, is using that printer again. And he said, here's this pretty fun poster map of Washington, but here's how you need to assemble it. So I spent a little time uh, here in the office yesterday, Michael. Daddy did it. Thank you, Michael. I'll put this up in the hallway for many, many students and visitors to the building to enjoy. Okay, got about five minutes left. I want to test something with you. Um, let me put my headphones on. Battery 100%. And connected to desk user, blah, blah, blah. Got it. All right, all right, cool. calm down. So I need to hear from you if you can hear Carl Loquist. This is on a loop. But I want to be able to play a little bit of video today, and I want you to make sure that you can hear it. And I don't do this enough to, know, to be confident about it. So this is <laughs> last weekend in September, uh, a few years ago. Can you hear Carl? Can you do uh, Carl or K? Carl starts with a K. Can you do K five by five if you can hear this? Health is this way. Mm -hmm. And we're standing on the end moraine of the Okanagan lobe of the Cordilleran ice sheet. Health is this way. Mm -hmm. And we're standing on the end moraine Thank you. of the Okanagan lobe of the courtier and okay that works thank you uh, appreciate it let me get out of that uh, I need to start locking in there is an incredible amount to keep track of here this morning and that's part of the fun uh, so I'll do a hot mic uh, in front of the uh, camera just to calm myself down. Okay, boy. There's so much stuff here for today's episode, you have no idea how you're going to do it.
you got docky, you got slides, you got video clips, you got hard copies of things, you got three guests to juggle. How are you going to do it all? You don't have to figure it out. You just ride it. Just, just let it go. Just, just build the momentum and just follow it. You're fine. You can do this. You're fine. The audience is on your side. Pressure's off. You got the stuff. Just follow your instincts and go. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to send you out the window with a shot of a live shot of the snow, which is about ready to stop anyway. And I'm going to uh, email our guests, take a little walk, and then uh, shortly after the top of the hour, we will begin today's episode. Thank you for joining us. I love you. See you in a few minutes. Okay, buddy. Just do it. Zoom window. Get that window over to the second monitor. You're going to invite three people on the same link. There's the invite. Probably all three of these cats are watching right now. All three are Gmail addresses. I'm sending from my Gmail address. And there it goes. I'm going to give you this shot. You know why? Because uh, it'll be fun for you to see these guys pop up on the screen. All right. See you in a few minutes. Thank you. I already did hot mic. I'm not doing hot mic again. Come on, man.
Good morning, everybody. How we doing? I'm glad you're all here. Uh, can we test everybody's audio? Uh, Jerome, what's the, you're doing fine, Jerome. Sky, how's it going? Yep, good. Joel? Okay, great. Are you guys all watching some sort of delayed video thing as well on a different monitor or are some of you blind? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sky. Okay. I don't think it's crucial, um, but uh, um, I th just to let you know, my 15 at the start is mostly just going through my old uh, Sharpie cartoons, just rifling through them and just getting getting the, the juices flowing a little bit, and then uh, then we'll bring you all on uh, at the same time. Feeling okay? Ready to go? Okay. <laughs> all right. Okay, we will. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, and we'll just, uh, I'll get you guys going for sure. I'm not going to just go, well, start talking, you know. So it's my job to get us going. But then once you guys get rolling, um, I'm just going to eat a ham sandwich and, and listen to it all. Okay, great. Well, I'm going to swing you off to the side. Um, 15 minutes or less. Thanks much. I'm glad you guys are all here. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Uh, what, what do you suggest for a safe word? Oh, you son of a bitch. Oh, Salisbury. I like that one better. Salisbury. Okay, yeah, that'll be our safe word. And uh, you might, can you guys mute yourself just in case? I noticed with in Richard's show he was not muted and I was doing a couple of things and he was trying to get his sweater on and whatever. So I'll remind you to unmute yourself when we're about ready to get you guys going. Okay, thanks much. Thanks. <clears throat> well, a pleasant good morning to you all, and welcome to Ellensburg, Washington, USA. This is Central Washington University. My name is Nick Zentner, and this is Episode Z of the Ice Age Floods A to Z live stream series. I'm so glad that you're with us, whether it's live or whether it's in replay. Maybe you're watching this years from now. Today's date is February 18th, 2024. So I mention that because there is a hope. It's maybe a glim, uh, or glim. It's maybe a, a distant or a, a, just a little glimmer of a hope that some of these shows in this series will actually propel new research. I don't know if that'll happen or not, but there's a chance. And so part of what we're doing today with our roundtable of guests is to brainstorm some ideas for new research, whether it's the guys in the round uh, around the table, or maybe it's uh, people that we haven't even met yet. But if you're a young professor or a young geology student and you have become very interested in this topic and the channeled scablands, um, there's all sorts of resources in person and not uh, waiting for you. And we would love collectively, I'm sure everybody involved in this series and maybe most of the folks at home as well, would love to see some new work done on the channeled scablands because one of the themes to today probably is it hasn't all been figured out. If nothing else, we've, sh we've shown that. There's all sorts of questions that linger even after all that fine work 100 years ago. Okay, so what is the plan? It's a loose plan, but what is the plan for today? Uh, 15 minutes or less with me. I guess I'm already started on the clock, so 10 minutes or less from me. That's the plan. Lightning fast. Setting the hook. Then we bring in all three of our guests simultaneously. And I, we're going to finish with a bang. This, we're not finishing with a whimper. So this is not some sort of, hey, Jerome, remember that time that I did that thing? And then Jerome goes, oh, yeah, that was, that was great. And I'm like, wasn't that awesome? He's like, yeah, that was awesome. And I'm like, 
Joel, can you believe that we had so many people watching that one show? Wasn't that awesome? Like, that's not what this is. <laughs> that's not what this is. We're going to finish with a bang. We're going to come up with decent questions. We're going to get into some weeds on certain topics. We're going to play off of what we've done in the series to this point, but there's much more than that. I'm confident of that. So is it an hour with our guests or more? I don't know. We'll just see how it goes. Will you have a chance to ask some live, que live questions of our three guests? Of course you will. That's part of the reason you're here. And then when we are done with our three guests and our roundtable discussion, I have two major surprises that came by email in the last 24 hours. They're major. So we'll do that when we're done with our series discussion with our three guests. But I'm excited to do that. And then, of course, we'll just kind of close the series and, and say goodbye to each other for a while. Okay, um, let's get us into this series. We first of all go to the website. And the website looks like this. It's nicksentner.com. And if you click on the word Brett's, by now you're getting the entire list. These are the entire list of Brett's field notes, Brett's Google Earth files by Glenn, newspaper clippings by Sharon, uh, each paper written by Brett's in the 20s and even beyond. And there's a bunch of new Google Earth files that I'm about to share with you, but th th those were added this morning, and I'll tell you that story in a bit. If you go to floods, of course, there's a treasure trove just all for episode Z here. Um, I won't take the time now, but our, our guest today took a peek at some of these things, so they might refer to a few of these papers as we discuss with them live. There's a guy from Yale that came in and said, well, 1937, I guess Flint sent me out here. I'm not even sure this is Till. I think this is something else. So that's an exciting uh, development. Uh, here's Flint in 1965 in a foreword to this book, uh, talking about historical perspective on glacial studies in North America. The Inqua Conference. Uh, I've got these incredible field guides that I scanned on my scanner this summer. And they're hard to get a hold of those things. But I have them here. So I borrowed these from Carl Loquist. So uh, I just love the look, the art design of these field guides. This is all from a 1965 conference. Uh, I'll show you a couple docky. So these field guides all have the same format, and these are geologists. It's kind of a summit meeting, essentially, of folks from around the world coming, similar to what they were doing in 1932 in the Grand Coulee, I might add. Uh, this is the International Association for Quaternary Research, and some of you hardcore fans or geologists know about these books. Uh, but the last two books, one of them is the Northern and Middle Rocky Mountains, and then the Pacific Northwest. And it's on this trip where the famous telegram was sent to Homewood, Illinois, saying we are all catastrophists. It's re related to this INQUA conference. So there's a big book and a big couple of uh, in impressive papers that are trying to correlate and summarize. And I love that. I love correlating and summarizing. And that's what Jerry Richmond was trying to do back in the mid-60s. And so, uh, yes, yeah, some of these things are coming from that INQUA conference. Uh, here's Brett's last paper, 1969. And interestingly, the last few pages of the last paper by Brett's J. Harlan Bretz in 1969 says, hey, by the way, before I sign off for good, here's 24 unsolved problems. Go crazy. Bretz wanted to see a whole new round of research. And one of the things we're going to do today with our guests is talk about are all 24 of those unsolved questions still unsolved questions? And can we pick up the baton directly from J. Harlan Bretz? 
in his 1965, uh, 1969 paper. Just setting up our discussion with our guest today. Uh, I included uh, uh, Stephen Porter writing a memorial after Richard Foster Flint dies in 1976. That's waiting for you. Uh, I've got uh, three different papers on the Spokane ice margin, which to me is more confusing than it should be. And that obviously has been one of our major uh, kind of study areas this entire winter. So I'll let you look at the differences between the Spokane ice margin discussions in the 60s and the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, and so on. And then, as I was hoping, beginning of the series, if you remember way back at the beginning of the series, I'm like, I don't know what we're going to discover together. We'll probably find some old documents. That'll be fun. And back in session A, I said, I also have a private hope that a bunch of geologists will eventually watch this stuff, and they'll contact me. And so I've been hearing from more and more geologists, I'm happy to say, including a geologist in Spogan by the name of Mike McCollum. And Mike, uh, a couple days ago, sent me four field guides that he wrote with his wife, Linda, at Eastern Washington University. And these are barely going to be touched on today. I haven't had a chance to absorb much of them yet, but Mike graciously has shared these guidebooks with us. And so you'll be able to go out and do your own field trips with some of this stuff. There's the field guide and where to park and all that sort of thing. And I will be using these guides from Mike McCollum uh, in the coming months. Thank you, Mike, for that. Okay. I want to show you a couple quick slides to get us into this. But before I get to those slides, maybe I might go a few extra minutes. Sorry, fellas. Um, let's go to Docky and just very, very quickly go through a bunch of our, this is not even in order. I, I've been so haphazard this morning, and I'll explain why later on this, this episode. So, yeah, we're talking about the scab lens. Yes, we're thinking about blue ice. Is it stage four? Is it stage six? Is it stage two? Is it stage 12? Still not sure. We talked about uh, the entire Ice Age suite of deposits, not just the most recent three in our color system, red for stage two, orange for stage four, six for is, is blue, uh, but we've got plenty of other older deposits as well. We introduced the idea of brown. Here's brown, but this brown in this sketch is just talking about the scab lands themselves, including the Grand Coulee where Steamboat Rock is located, and Moses Cooley, and the upper Columbia River south of Chelan. And we've been playing with the idea that all of these trenches, all of these gutters coming across the border from British Columbia, perhaps were the major story. If we're looking for major themes this winter, I've been bold in some cases, less bold in other cases. Let me be really bold right now. If the next generation of Ice Age flood research, if it happens, by a whole crop of young, enthusiastic, attractive people, puts this story together, that the Brett's investigations of 100 years ago turn out to be more right than wrong, then possibly the Glacial Lake Missoula story is less of a major part of the story, and maybe this business of subglacial flow is the major story. Now, does that make you uncomfortable? It's not the company line. But I've seen enough here this winter with you that it's at least worth more work north of the Scablands with our new technologies to possibly say, hey, I think we have a major story that has been undocumented or poorly documented or not thought of very much in the last few years, maybe it's a time to return to some of that business. I know that's radical talk. Stage six, stage two, playing with it, inset geography, inset geology, the stages over in the Puget Lowland with our different stages. No order here, just screwing around. Town of Spokane, older, bigger, younger, smaller, is that a thing? And you're like, Boy, you really are stubborn. I thought we all decided together that that's not a thing anymore. I thought we just heard from Richard Waite and a few others, like, that's just not a thing. Well, if you want to call me stubborn, I guess you can. But again, I think we're going to hear from our guests today, and they're going to go, 
there's a lot of threads here that need inspection. Right. How much time are we talking about? If there truly is an older or a series of older ice sheets that are bigger, how much time elapses between those old big ice sheets and the smaller, younger ice sheets? And of course, I'm not just talking about the ice sheets with these options. I'm also talking about if you have a big ice sheet, do you have big cataclysmic floods tied to each of those ice advances? I think I keep seeing this in various locations, whether it's the buried uh, channels uh, at the head of the Cheney Palouse that Chad Pritchett was talking about, or if we're up at Foster Cooley, uh, or if we're in the Grand Cooley itself, is this a common theme, and are we mostly just focusing on the red and not realizing that there's a much older story as well? Yeah, today's maps in the last 40 years have looked like this. The ice never got to Spokane. But if we are at some point deciding for sure that the ice did come to Spokane, using new technologies and a reinvestigation of some of these deposits, is it stage four ice or is it stage six ice or older? We haven't looked at this one in a long time. I never even bothered to redo it. But taking the idea of it, what the hell happened to the Spokane ice sheet? Is it really blue? Is it really stage six? And is the major story of major floods coming through the Scablands that old? This is the Jerry Richmond map from 1965, which I gave you a sneak peek of back in the Lake, Glacial Lake Missoula show with, with Larry Smith. But look what, look what uh, Richmond and Paul Weiss have. They've got stage six, or they've got some blue ice coming down the Rathdrum Prairie. Good Lord, man. This is like 1965. I'm alive, man, when they're making this map. So admittedly, this is not the Spokane ice sheet that we've been looking at in the 1920s, but they still have some kind of Spokane ice sheet. What happened to it? Why'd it go away? All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. Way back at the beginning of the series, here are our four questions, our four open questions. Did all the floods come from Montana? Did all the Ice Age floods in the channeled Scablands flow younger than 30,000 years ago? Are there secrets buried in the Lewis Hills of southeastern Washington? And who and what strongly influenced J. R. Harlan Bretz before he got off the train on August 1st, 1922 in Spokane? Fellas, I'm coming to you in three minutes. But before we go there to the fellas, we go to the slides to set them up specifically. We're not going to listen to Carl Oquist again, but we are going to listen to one video clip that I really want to share with you. Health is this? So these guys are coming in just a second. We will learn a lot from the three kings of the Ice Age. Brian Atwater, a very important Ice Age floods geologist and geologist in general in the Pacific Northwest, was the main mentor to Joel Gombiner as Joel was doing his studies at the University of Washington. And this photo was taken in the sand poil just a few months ago. And Brian uh, politely declined to be part of this series. Fine. But between Jerome and Joel and Brian, a lot of these ideas we've been talking about this winter were going around the breakfast table and throughout that whole weekend in the town of Grand Coulee. I have every intention to make a bunch of new field videos with geologists out in the field in the next few months involving the Ice Age. I want to follow through on some of these things. But when I'm out with a geologist making these field videos that get posted on my YouTube channel, I feel like I have two jobs and two jobs only when I'm filming them. One, I got to keep the camera going and keep them in frame. Okay, fine. But two, I need to make sure I am thoroughly wide awake and listening as hard as I can to what the geologist is saying when we're out in the field together so that we can actually have a conversation. 
I don't know if it feels rare to you. It feels rare to me that conversations oftentimes don't have people on the other end thinking, uh, listening very carefully. They're distracted. They're looking at their watch. They're looking down the hall. I don't know about you. I need this. I need eye contact. I need somebody really listening to what I have to say. And then I promise I'm not going to talk too long as I am right now. And so this moment I'm about to share with you from May of 2021, where I'm filming Atwater and listening as hard as I can, was the precise moment that I thought, oh, I need to do a whole alphabet on this. I can't believe Atwater just said that. I thought about it the whole way home, a two-hour drive from Steamboat Rock to Ellensburg. By the time I pulled into the driveway and said hi to Bijou the cat, I'm like, I'm going to do an alphabet series on the Ice Age floods. Atwater just opened up a whole new thing for me. What did he say? I could get my headphones on for this. What did he say? What did he say, Patrick? Brian, go. Um, but the simpler explanation based on what you see uh, uh, at Lake Roosevelt upstream from and, and in the around the corner at, at the sand pile is that these are some the sandy units here represent late floods from Lake Missoula from and, Lake Missoula and then the bottom and then the the varves we see from the from the river lake that was here throughout but where you have only those varves and no sandy interruptions that those those are the post flood units <clears throat> We'll see, well, God, I'm we'll still see fuzzy them well. On that. Still fuzzy on that. The, the breaching, the opening of the upper Grand Coulee. Yeah. The, the ice is here. The ice is not here. We're done with water from Montana. Yeah, yeah. There's a whole sequence. And, it, and it's kind of, and then there's room for, there's plenty of room for debate with, with those various steps. But the, probably the simplest explanation is that the coulee was already cut before the glaci last glaciation even started. Uh, the coulee served as as the low-level outlet for Glacial Lake Columbia, except when the coulee was blocked by ice, at its at the oh, maybe when it was laying down that till. <laughs> okay, and and there would have been floods that ran through here before then, and we don't see traces of them, but you do see traces of them in the Columbia Valley, and then you there. Did, are, you didn't just say. The simplest is to view this coulee pre twenty thousand years ago. Yeah, that's the that's, really. Well, there's a new. You should get Richard out with you to. He has a. He has evidence for lots of back flooding into Quincy Basin, mm -hmm. and with the gravels being very well weathered. I'm familiar with that, but I I. I thought we didn't have the Grand Coulee at that time, that this is water coming right, down to Columbia right, and then back flooding. Into, right, right, right. But you're thinking this is this is all cut. How many people are saying that? The upper Grand Coulee has been cut pre-20,000 years ago. Uh, <laughs> this is one of the things that that Bretz and, and Flint agreed upon. Well, you're blowing my mind right now. Hang on. <laughs> I didn't even... <laughs> I didn't even know much about Plint at the time, Richard Foster Flint, but that was such a big moment for me. I just, I just could not believe that. The fact that you in excavate a coulee long before you lay down those deposits. And we've been thinking about that all winter. So when we look at a map like this, to me, I'm sorry, to me, this is not enough. This is not enough to just have one ice sheet from one time in Glacial Lake, Missoula, and the Channel Scablands. I'm not satisfied with that anymore. We have to have multiple ice advances, somehow. So can we flesh out the story a little bit more, please? Can we not just do this? And so this is, again, 1965, and the guys in 1965 are bringing this ice sheet to Spokane, but having it come down the Rathdrum Prairie. What happened to this story? We're going to explore that today. Last thing. Speaking of surprises, this map was created yesterday by Sky Cooley. He just whipped it up. I don't know how he did it. Just yesterday, 
But our color scheme, stage two ice, older than stage two, blue. And if we talk about the entire North American scene, from New England to the Midwest to the Pacific Northwest, Sky is helping us see this older, bigger, younger story. We're just playing with it. We're just playing with it. But is there an older ice blue tongue poking out at Spokane like there apparently is in the Puget Lowland and other places? Okay, thank you for your patience, fellas. I got my headphones on. Unmute yourself, please. Let's get you on camera, and we'll just go for it. Four heads on screen, live. Let's do it. Jerome Lesman, how are you this morning? Good, thank you. And yourself? Th I'm doing just great. Thank you for being with us. How about you, Sky? How's the weather there in Montana? Terrific. We got a little snow. Excellent. And in downtown Seattle, Joel, what's up? Good morning, Nick. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you guys. Thank you. Um, we, we don't have a plan. We got together a little bit on Friday evening just to hash out a couple of ideas, but this is purposefully um, loose. And we'll just say how quickly we can get into the flow here. I have no doubt that we will. Let's start with you, Jerome. I had those four open questions, and you helped me kind of uh, flesh a few of those ideas out. Um, which, which of those, or you can come up with your own open question, which are the most obvious open questions to you? Let's just go for it right away. Can you remind me what the four were? You have your sure. Again? <laughs> and there's a less question. That was an interesting one. The um, less one, yes. The, I mean, the less one is interesting as a, as we said, I think as an archive that ties some parts together. Like there's a record there that doesn't exist elsewhere and it's complementary. And so I think it's good to not view these two things as separate floods versus less as separate because they're kind of coupled. So that's an, for me, that's an interesting angle. I hadn't and given it as much, like I didn't sort of realize the, the weight of it. Let's put it that way. And, and the second of the four was, uh, does everything have to be younger than 30,000 years ago? So, <laughs> yeah. uh, so besides the Luss, uh, have you learned a few things this winter, Jerome, that gives you more interest in older than 30,000 years ago? Are you still kind of viewing everything probably red time? I'm, I'm probably red time because I think largely the evidence for blue time is really difficult to substantiate. That's re yeah. I mean, that's the main reason why. Right? I don't really know what we can hang our hats on. But there's still, I think, interesting questions around the blue times or the possibility. But I think what, wherever we want to put, whatever time frame we want to put things in, um, I think there are events at different moments, wherever we put those moments. I think that's the key thing. Putting everything in red doesn't mean that all the events sort of collapse into one single sequence. There, might, there could be different episodes of flooding, even within uh, a shortened time span. Red. Uh, Sky, you said something similar in one of those episodes that you felt like once you get older than 30,000 years ago, our, our age dating techniques seem to go to hell. Um, are you as pessimistic as Jerome? I think I'm hearing that, that we just don't have much hope for really pinpointing a bunch of earlier flood events, or at least ice sheet events. Uh, do you have a little bit more potential in your mind for some of these older stories? I do. I think there is clear evidence in Columbia Valley that Brian mentioned for older floods. And Jerome, we agree on that. Yeah. Um, I think the the preponderance of evidence, you know, 99% of the evidence out there in eastern Washington, northern Idaho, northwest Montana is red, right? That's right. our late Wisconsin. And so we're dealing with a tiny, tiny fraction. Do I think that the future will yield better dates, age dates? Absolutely. I mean, that's the one thing we can say is that future technology and future techniques and smart people are going to get together and solve some of those technical issues. I think right now what we have is cross-cutting relationships and whether we know if it's 35,000 or 135,000 years old, 
we're not who cares i mean there's a there's a point at which it's like you know people used to argue is the mount saint helens ash 16,000 years old or is it 16.2 thousand years? well who cares yeah. who cares yeah. so I, I guess i'm in that camp where i do see at least two stages i mean right here in my hometown i see at least three glacial stages but how old they are to put a number on them not there Okay, well, that's the terrestrial story, and yes, I think the the any time I can just speak for myself with emails that I've received from geologists and non-geologists over the course of the winter, they're like, "Well, I'm open to this idea of older advances and even older floods, but uh, I think we pretty much realized that those Missoula floods were destructive and they wiped out so much of the material that even if the Spokane area does have some older evidence." It's probably not there anymore. It's just so fragmentary that you can't put a story together. And yet we have Joel with us who says, I've looked offshore and we have a record out there that appears to be more complete and does go back earlier than red time. And so, Joel, do you agree that more work, can more work be done with those deposits you were talking about out in the Astoria fan uh, that go back a hundred thousand years or more. Yeah, and just to remind remind people that you know two thirds of the sandy turbidites in that core are pre twenty thousand years old. Two thirds. Yeah, but that it's one site and it's it's a complex uh, dynamic submarine fan with channels switching around, so it. It would be like trying to reconstruct the history of the channeled scabland from just one outcrop. Yeah, yeah. Huh. So we need to do a lot more work on deep sea drilling and looking at seismic data. There's buried channels in reflection seismic data for the Astoria fan. And we only have one drill core. Hmm. But it's hmm. it's this tantalizing clue that there's the, the preponderance of the flooding happened prior to 20,000 years ago. And it makes complete sense that repeated flooding through the same channels on land just strip out these older records and that we only see fragmentary evidence on land of older events. Hmm. Excellent. Okay, well, those are the opening statements that I just basically kind of uh, shoehorned you guys into, basically. But y you have so much to offer. It's not like Joel is only a story of fan and, and Sky is only Rocky Mountain geology and jo and Jerome is only, you know, whatever. You guys are well read. You've been so into this series. I'm thankful again that you've not only agreed to be on, but you've been in the live chat and everything else. So this is a golden opportunity for me to basically shut up and and have you guys just go for it, whether it's you sharing some stuff on your screen. Um, do you want me to nudge you a little bit more or does somebody just want to just take it from right here? I've already been as bold as I want where I think that if if, if we've got ice over Spokane and we therefore have the, the ice front and the channel heads at some time before 30,000 years ago, then suddenly subglacial flow coming down the uh, Okanagan or subglacial flow coming into Moses Cooley, suddenly that doesn't seem so crazy anymore. And that this is the main story across the ice front. Now, that's clearly a, 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 a wrench in the whole series, but we've been nibbling at that, whether people are aware of it or not. Who wants to take it from here? How do you want to go? Jerome? Um, sure. You want me, you I, want me I, to, I, how do you want to no, go? No, no. So, because I got shoehorned into a question, I'm going to have to shoehorn myself out of it a little bit Beautiful. before we get going. Beautiful. So, when you're asking about evidence for red or blue, it's easy. I think I just fell in the same trap that we often fall into. I don't want to give the impression that I don't think there's any evidence for blue. Yep. And so, it's really the, the area where we've been looking for blue that I find the, the evidence to be. You know, so the glacial evidence for glacial ice during the blue times. Okay. That's where I find it's it doesn't it's hard to substantiate that notion, but as Joel said, there's an offshore record. It's 
seems to be complex. We don't, you know, we have some information. It's better than no information, but it's not something that you can necessarily build the most reliable picture from. There is evidence of older floods that are that have some chronology around them. Um, so we weave something together from that perspective. So is there an old record? Yes. How old is it? I guess that varies where you are. And is there a young record? And as I said, most of what we see on, on the surface today, the most accessible material is probably more likely red. That would be, but that doesn't preclude the presence of other things older. That's good. You've stated that for the record now. That's good. That, that, that's a three-dimensional thing. I, but I, I can't hold it. Why are you guys invited to be on this thing? Why do you? Why do I invite you guys to keep coming back? Not only do you, well, don't shrug, <laughs> Scott. Here's the answer: You guys are open. You guys are open and curious, and not in defensive mode from the start. That's a whole other way to talk about this winter. Like I'll say it, if you guys don't want to say it, it feels like some geologists are not that interested in new ideas. They just want to keep talking about the work they've done over the past few years, and they give the impression that everything's been solved. And so it's not only that you guys are younger, quote unquote, but you're also like leaning into these things that are just, this is fun. This is fun to think about new things, whether you invest 10 years in research or not. Like that's, that's the spirit that I feel like is often missing with this classic Missoula flood story that I told in session A. I mean, that, that episode, episode A got viewed way more than the rest of this series because people came for the answer. Like, oh, there's the Missoula flood story. Thank you. I got what I needed and I'm, I'm, I'm out. But the talking in episode A was setting up all this curiosity about these new questions. And to me, that's the fun. Okay, I feel better. Well, okay. Yeah. So, okay, let's go with this. And then I'll let the other guys yeah. take over. Um, if there's one thing that shouldn't happen out of this series is the feeling that the story is told. Right. That's really what I, I it would not be a good place to end. It would be, not be a good way to end the series. There are a ton of questions still to be resolved. And some of those questions go way back to Brett's early questions that are still completely open. Still open. Completely open for all kinds yeah. of reasons. And there's a whole other new set of questions that uh, are sort of some, you know, we've been poking at in the series, but also through some of the work that we've been doing. And there will undoubtedly be newer questions that emerge out of any work that gets done in the future. So this is not a done deal. This is not a told story. There's a lot of contradictions that still exist in terms of how, and it's partly from which perspective we approach the problem. And then you run into these contradictions, these things that don't quite work together. And that's where the interesting thinking comes around. Yeah, and I just want to jump in and echo yeah. that and put the, the message out there that I have benefited enormously from mentorship from all three of you. And it, it inspires me to do the same thing for whoever is watching this and wants to study this. So I just want to put the message out there that we're here to help you guys. You can, I'm going to put my email in the chat. All um, right, Joel, nice. But you know how to find us, and we're excited about seeing more people work on this. Whatever question interests you, you can literally drive to Moses Cooley tomorrow and discover something new. So, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, reach out to us. We, we know some things. We don't know everything. But... That's what I've experienced from the community and want to give back to everybody who's watching. Well, thank you, Joel. Let's do more with that. How old are you? Would you mind telling? Are you in your early 30s? <laughs> Mid to early. Okay. Yeah. So where are your peers? I don't, am I sleeping on this? Or where are all the people in the late 20s, early 30s who are working on this? I don't know if anybody that's part of the reason you're part of this like you're the future of some of this so you can tell your own story i guess why did you choose to get into the scab lands and were you encouraged or was this just use with a singular mind like i know it's a bunch of old dudes but i'm, I'm gonna go in there and, and see what i can do yeah i mean um i got into it because of an undergraduate research project I did with Sydney Hemming at Columbia University. 
where I just stated I wanted to study something related to where I was from in the Pacific Northwest. And she had this project on offshore sediments and an idea that they could be related to the Missoula floods. So that was my entry point. And the more I read about it, the more I realized how fascinating it is and how many unanswered questions there are. And I got hooked on the subglacial hypothesis, seeing this back and forth in the 1999 paper between Shaw et al. and the res- comment in response to that. And I thought, okay, here's something where there's a, a big unknown. And so then when I went into my PhD, I just kind of kept digging and looking for what what don't we know about this topic? And that's what led me to Moses Cooley as sort of this center point of where we don't understand things. And um, that in turn led to the the work I've done with Jerome and tracing out um, tunnel channels and finding evidence to support subglacial flooding. And um, it's it's just been so interesting to see how Like you said, some people perceive the topic as solved, which is a message I heard repeatedly in my career that this topic is kind of wrapped up. There's a bow on it. There's 40 floods. We're done here. We know the story of the channeled scab land. But then the more you read and dig, the more you realize that's not the case. There's a lot of mysteries. And if you're open to exploring them, there's new science to be done. Thank you. Sky, what is your story? Why do you keep uh, chipping away at some of this? Is it just a hobby or is it more than that for you? Well, it's always been uh, certainly a hobby, but it's it's important to me. This is, uh, you know, when I think about vacation, you know, I'd like to go play golf in uh, you know, Hawaii or something, but I can't afford really to do that. But I do like tooling around in the scablands. <laughs> and I've benefited from people um, taking the time to help me understand things. Uh, a lot of those folks you've interviewed, and these two guys have taught me a huge amount, and I continue to learn. So my interest in the Scabland started in college and has just continued, and I, I've hardly missed a year. I think I missed one year when we moved to Alaska. I couldn't get back. Um but I spent hundreds and hundreds of days out there. And I guess my focus has always been, I understand the literature. I know the people who wrote it. And there's a disconnect between when you get together with people versus when you just read their papers. I also know that there are errors and there are personalities involved too. And those things tend to obscure what's out there in the field. There's also sort of a around specifically around the Missoula flood stuff is there's a huge popular literature um, part. Whereas if you studied, you know, an orthocytes in Wyoming, there's no popular literature, right? None. So there's this huge world that, uh, is largely clueless uh, in terms of the production of, I mentioned, you know, the Discovery Channel. I was a a grip for two days with the Discovery Channel when Vic Baker was being filmed. And the producer on that was, I mean, the incentives have nothing to do with the geology or telling a story right. I mean, just like arbitrary uh, ideas about how to convey the topic. And, you know, Vic's like trying to shoehorn these guys back. Okay, we're actually doing science here. Yeah, these guys don't give a shit. So so there's some personalities and there's this huge literature body. And then there's this popular literature body. And I think that what I've seen is a problem between both the professional side. People don't want to tell certain stories, don't want to publish on certain things, want to ignore certain things for reasons, and the popular literature is always competing with the professional stuff. And so the popular literature seems to have solved everything, right? They've they've produced the big show. But if you spend any time in the field with the professionals, whether they're 80 years old or 30 years old, 
none of us go, oh yeah, it was all solved. And none of us are polishing these narratives that has kind of been going on for about 40 or 50 years. There's been sort of this lack of new work. Okay, I'll shut up. No, 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 no. I just, I want to get this before we lose it. This is a new thought for me right now. Is it an accident that there's not a lot of National Science Foundation money for the branch of geology that's the most popular? <laughs> and studying feldspars in the Laramie Range, there doesn't seem to be a lot of problem coming up with funding for that. At least that's my impression. The obscure research topics seem to have no trouble with the funding. So why do I keep hearing that it's hard to get grants, it's hard to get funding and have a research program on the Ice Age floods? Is it is the popular part of this an angle at all that makes sense? Well, I don't know the answer to that, but I do see that NSF, you know, has priorities that they set up every decade or so. And okay. we're kind of on the tail end of climate research and probably going into some other priority here, maybe AI. Um, I, huh. I think there've been, there's been a lot of money spent and maybe, and maybe, um, quaternary geology has sort of hit a wall and some of the dating techniques have not worked out as well as we'd hoped. <clears throat> and maybe it's just a, a, the idea that we'd like to be more physics, chemistry, and big computing in geology and not so much delineating moraines and lines on maps. You know, maybe there's some of that. I don't know. What do you guys think? Yeah, Jerome, just to yeah. jump in, if yeah. you, if you look at what has been funding, it's, funded recently, it's the landscape evolution angle, which is, I think, one of your big questions. So it's modeling how basalt erodes into channels and coolies and how, um, you know, how flood water flows across the landscape. There's been some funding for that, but dating whether something was 16 or 16.5, as Sky said, is not a priority for the NSF. And they do, they do value what they call broader impacts and and outreach, but that has to be a, alongside one of their core science priorities. And those do change over time. So I think the challenge for researchers is crafting a proposal that hits, hits those themes while also being compelling and also having a broader impact on, on society. And that's quite difficult to do. I've seen quite a few proposals that, that haven't worked out because they just didn't quite do that. But, to, you know, I think one of the things inspiring about this is that you don't need an NSF proposal to right. do research. You can, and sometimes that can, it can even be limiting. It can put you in a box. And um, what Sky has done, what Jerome and I have done is just kind of doing it on our own time, basically. And what everybody who's watching is doing. I mean, I have been floored by the, the serious contributions from people who are not professors, who are not grad students, who I don't even know if they have any formal scientific training, but they're operating at a at a high level and contributing to the science. So yes. that's amazing to me. And that's because of your, you know, presentation and the way you invite them to do that. Yeah. Well, Thank this you. has been missing too. I mean, what Nick is doing is totally new, right? This is this is totally new and producing discoveries all the time. Let me just say one quick thing about before I lose it with what Joel says. Um, I think the avenues for future research, if it involves floods, is the development for residences in places like northwest Montana and eastern Washington. I mean, eastern Washington is a frontier for home development, right? And so groundwater issues are going to be a huge deal in the future. And so along with landscape development, landscape evolution, and sort of leveraging high resolution topography and physical models and some smart uh, approaches, land use development and the human environment are two things that could go into a grant and be probably better received by those editors and NSF than talking about red and blue or Bull Lake and Pinedale or Brett's, frankly. 
Um, so you might be able to do the geology. Some enterprising person might be able to do the geology without putting the proposal out to do the geology. Mm. Yeah. Jerome. Yes. You must Can I have. On this? Well, yeah, yeah. You're, yeah. Not in, you're not in your early 30s. Come on, man. I mean, you've been no, at this I'm, a I'm, while. I'm the blue to Joel's red. Let's just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you, you've run into... Okay, have, so yeah, I go you, back a while. I go back. I go. I mean, I'm a, I was a, a co-author on the 99 paper that Joel mentioned. I did my thesis on subglacial water things in southern BC in the Okanagan. So Joel and I had a kind of an, a, a good sort of context to meet and work together, which has worked out great. Um, yeah, the question is, is, a, is a thorny one. I mean, the GSA offer, I mean, I benefited from student grants as a student. Uh, from the GSA, so there is some money available there. But in terms of the NSF funding, or on my end, what's called NSERC, which is the federal funding body, um, we're about an order of magnitude smaller in terms of the amount of money, but the funding model is a little bit different. But regardless, there is there is some some funds, but um, not tons. And I think it's a combination of factors that lead to that right now and the interest. One of it is that, and to Sky's point, maybe the the, the um, the mainstream, let's call it the mainstream of the public facing narrative of the Channel Scabland story is nice and tidy and perpetuates this idea that there's nothing else to discover or no other questions to ask because there's sort of a neat story that you might, that you can tell. Um, that story is also very much focused on the scientific debate aspects of it. as And, and the, the geology is a backdrop to the sort of scientific the struggle for scientific debates that happen around that, rather than the focus on the, the, the geology questions themselves. So there's a bit of a disconnect there. So it becomes almost like a story of the philosophy of science rather than a story about the geology and the coolies and the interactions between ice sheets and proglacial areas and so forth. So the, the, the story gets mixed up. Um, on the quaternary side of things, because that's sort of my, my background, um, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's an area where if, Maybe maybe part of the issue is that for a long time, the early days of quaternary, it was about mapping. It was mapping landforms. But if all you do is map and the interpretations are not, or the big picture questions that arise out of that mapping aren't fully integrated, um, then maybe it seems like it's really just a, a, a documenting effort rather than a, a big picture effort to try to answer, you know, big questions. But the Scabland, you know, the Scabland, story with the ice sheet is a climate story oh. you know you cannot understand today's climate without looking to the past it's very difficult to look to the past we've talked about these these marine isotope records but when when we're looking at the dynamics of a glacier we get a, a perspective that's very different especially when we try to reconstruct it and um there are aspects of that dynamic that we cannot resolve from the ice the, the isotope record offshore there's also an aspect of that ice sheet record that we can't resolve from looking at just the modern glaciers today because we just don't have the right the amount of time to do that. So there, it's a complementary effort that needs to go into it. And some of the scabland work informs us about what the Cordilleran ice sheet is doing. And the Cordilleran ice sheet is a big ice sheet built on top of mountains, which is exactly what you have in Greenland today that's deglaciating. And big parts of Antarctica are like that. They're direct analogs and parallels. And so what we gain in understanding about the Cordilleran ice sheet potentially informs us too about what happens in modern ice sheets. So those things are not so disconnected or so esoteric that they shouldn't be, you know, there shouldn't be any information. Huh. Having said all that, I don't know how, and I, I speak from the guy who lives on the other side of the lines, but I don't know how you would do any geology in eastern Washington, east of the Cascades, without having the Scablands as your framework oh. to understand. There are deposits that are out of the norm, that end up in areas that are out of the norm in terms of what... And, and you will encounter those. Sky talked about groundwater, that's a big one, uh, engineering, all sorts of applications. I mean, Kathy Truth's work in the Puget Sound on fundamentally quaternary questions is in large part driven by neotectonics and the need to identify faults in Seattle. <laughs> there are applications to this kind of work that go well beyond the immediate questions, but they're, they're, the, the foundation for that is the, the quaternary story. And in Eastern Washington, that story, the, like the, the Scabland story is part of the geologic DNA of, that, of central yeah. Washington. And you can't escape it. 
Well, let's go there. Let's go there. Let's let's go to Moses Cooley or let's go to other key spots that we've talked about this winter or that we haven't, uh, whether it's slides from you guys or just um, however you want to do it. But let's um, let's shift the focus a little bit, at least in the next 15 minutes. And then, viewers, I think we're going to come to you sooner than later. I think in 15 minutes we'll get to you, and then we'll just kind of bounce off of what you guys want to ask about. So does anybody have any slides? I mean, I'm curious. I know that Joel and Jerome have been writing a paper together. Uh, what's the status of that Moses Cooley paper? Uh, I, I think I, it's in the, it's in process. And so in process of the, it's, it's going through peer review and I don't know okay. what we want to do. We're, I think we're happy to talk about what it is. I don't think we want to talk too much about the, the process itself just because it's an ongoing thing and we, you know, it should, it should remain that way. That if all, you, if, that's great. Yeah. I have a couple slides to show um, about Moses Cooley. If we yeah. want to go to that. Let's do that, Joel. Let's do it. Yeah. Thank you. So, so if all goes well, this new paper on Moses Cooley by these two guys will be out in the next year. Is that fair to say that if all goes well, I would say in the next month or two. Wow. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. And before you put this, well, or as Joel cues up the deck, yeah, um, this is speaking directly to one of Brett's open question in that paper that you posted, okay? Or more than one, but one big question on there. You know, he's got a question on flood sources other than Missoula, okay? Brett's had that flag. He had that flag real early in his career, and it lingered and remained, and it's still an open question. And so that article, that work, and we've talked about the gutters and all that stuff, but that's that is the that's what we're tackling here. Jerome, did you discuss this at all in that ninety nine paper? Was Moses Cooley at all in there? In Shaw? Um at some point it was. It got trimmed, I think, at some point, but okay. initially that was part of the part and parcel of that idea of you know, it was called back to Brett's and so the idea was to revisit this idea of alternative sources or additional sources, but also with a subglacial angle to them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we can see things. Oh, good. We're going to do a little Excel here, Joel. Nice. Oh, this is not, not what I wanted to do. How about no. that? So yeah, this, 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 this is great. So what do you see right now? Do you see a map? Yeah. see a, a beautiful map, and if we can get your cursor on there, that would be even better. So you can see my cursor now? We yeah. sure can. Okay. Go for it. Please. Yeah, so um, I think a lot of the viewers are familiar with Moses Cooley, which is here on this map and they're familiar with the idea that it it emerges sort of um, subtly in, in the middle of a plateau. And they're also probably familiar with the idea that there, there's clear evidence for mega floods, glacial outburst floods in Moses Cooley. And the traditional explanation for the source of those floods is that they came from the east, from Missoula floods that came into Glacial Lake Columbia and then through one way or another spilled across this plateau into Moses Cooley, either along a pathway like this, or maybe even a path like this. So that's, if you go to the literature, the source of the Moses Cooley floods is, is Lake Missoula. And I, I was sitting down to write my dissertation and stating that there's no obvious channel connections between the head of Moses Cooley and the Columbia River. And then I realized I hadn't really looked. So I started just tracing channels on the plateau upstream of Moses Cooley. And that is what led to this map that you're looking at now. All of these blue zones are the boundaries of channels. And what emerged from that very long tracing process, um, which was based on using d digital elevation models in Google Earth, is that there's not a channel system following one of the proposed spillover paths, but there's instead this radial architecture that almost perfectly mirrors the outline of the Okanagan lobe. Mm -hmm. So what we see is channels coming down from the north and then splaying outwards in all directions towards this white line, which is the ice, former ice sheet margin. And the best way that Jerome and I have come up to explain that, come up with to explain that, is that these were formed by water following uh, 
hydro potential or pressure gradients underneath the ice. So the ice was thicker to the north and then it reached a zero thickness at the margin, which means that the water pressure was higher to the north and lower in all directions out towards this margin. So these channels are in our mind best explained by subglacial water flow and they connect either directly to Moses Cooley or to proglacial channels on the margin of the ice sheet that funnel into Moses Cooley. So this is evidence that the source of the Moses Cooley floods is at least one of the main sources was probably not spillovers from glacial Lake Columbia and Missoula floods, but instead was subglacial water coming under the ice and basically feeding directly into Moses Cooley. Hey, Joel. Yeah. What, as we're looking at this map together, if there's someone who loves and insists even today after seeing this map that the water carving Moses Cooley is coming from Montana, what, what's the reaction to this map? Do, do they just, you know, what's their reaction to this map? Have they looked at some of these Missoula folks looked at this map and, and not backed away from their statements? Um, well, I mean, the, the, the prior interpretation of these ch channels on the plateau was that they're formed by uh, proglacial meltwater as the ice is retreating. At least yeah. that was my understanding. Yeah. So they would say that they might say that um, I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I haven't got that reaction yet from anyone, but they okay. might say that they're just not subglacial channels. They're formed at the edge of the ice. I don't know how that works. Well, the channels the have never been this clear, though. That's one thing, yeah. right? The, yeah. the channel pattern has never been mapped to this extent, and so it was never this clear. Larry Hansen mapped some of them in the 70s. So he mapped this area. The, the so-called Mansfield channels, but not the whole network as we've mapped them. Yeah, and they might quibble about whether some things are really channels. So we've included the... Um, the headwaters of West Foster Creek as tunnel channels or as, as um, I mean, one thing to say here is that there's, there's a palimpsest in this landscape. There's water flowing through in multiple ways. So if you look at this zone, you know, there's surface water flowing down gradient that has to some degree eroded these headwaters of West Foster Creek, but we also see it as connecting into this subglacial system. So they might come in and they're free to do that. We're going to post the KML and they might delete some channels. But I would oh. say that even if you start taking stuff out, it's hard to escape this overall architecture um, of the channel network. Totally. Yeah. yeah. So, so just building on the older, bigger, younger, smaller hypothesis, your data is surficial. Right. This That's is right. the surface of it. So, mm -hmm. okay. So, if there were deeper or older channels, they would be the larger channels and probably correspond to the larger blue swaths that you've mapped. Is there any route for old floods through a Columbia system with water sourced from Montana in your channel network? Do you, can you possibly trace out a scenario in the channels that you've mapped mm -hmm. for an older landscape? Yeah, I mean, you can, so you can sort of, you can sort of see um, a channel system kind of going this way. I mean, you'd have to zoom in to really look at it, but there is um, sort of a hint of northeast to southwest orientations in some of these channels here. Hmm. Um, those look minor to me. I agree. Yeah. So it, it's it's pretty hard to explain a lot of them. They also one of the one of the pieces of evidence that they formed in a subglacial environment is that the the bed slopes of the channels rise and then fall over hydrologic divides. Mm -hmm. So that's hard to explain with surface water, but it's quite um, easy to explain in a subglacial environment. So the Okanagan Valley is a big part of the Waterville Plateau's story. 
that's how we would see it. Yeah. And I mean, I, I don't know how filled in these valleys were at the time that the ice was here, but there's, you know, you know more about it than I do, but there's a lot of sediment on the margins of this valley. And was that sediment totally filling the valley to a much higher level at the time that the Okanagan lobe was in existence? Well, whether, yeah, that, that works yet to be done. So I guess I just, I don't want to dominate here. I, I just kind of wanted to go back to, did, did you answer, did you guys answer one of Brett's questions in your new work? Which, uh, remind <laughs> yeah, just, question? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think the answer is, is there a source of water joining the Scabland roots? From there, I think the answer is yes. There's a yeah. there's I think we have better evidence with this network. It works, it explains better a connection to Moses Cooley than any other existing scenario right now. We don't have to get into the details of every the minutiae of every other scenario, but this works better. And even if you make allocations for maybe a bit of water coming from Lake Columbia and Missoula together, you still need to explain this network of channels. This still, you know, which you can't do with just an overspill. The overspill only allows you to get water into Moses Schooley in that singular point. But there's a whole network there. It's a, as you said, it's a, a, a component of that network is quite young, as in it's blue. It's lace was, it's red. Pardon me, I'm getting my colors mixed up. It's, uh, it's red. It's late Wisconsin, um, and it's subglacial. It's subglacial because the channels go uphill. It's subglacial because there's moraines and eskers that drink the, from the recession of the lobe. And so the channels predate the low, the maximal extent of the lobe. And then there's recession that leaves the eskers and leaves the recessional moraines. Overprinting that, you can see the white lines and the green little segments on there. So those relationships put this network pretty firmly operating subglacially relatively recently. And that um, funnels water into Moses School. Well, that's a new mode of transport for the flood stories, for sure. And what I take away from your work uh, is all that you said. But I, the the big picture for me is that you've connected the Scablands below Columbia River to valleys that lead directly out of Canada, and that connection has never been made. So that's the takeaway that I really see out of your work here, which is awesome. And as, as to Nick's point, there's no reason to, I mean, the Okanagan is probably the big, one of the biggest of those North South valleys, but it's certainly not the only one. And there's no reason in my mind to think that this process would be unique to the Okanagan Valley. Right. It, it yep. may be that there's um, a unique bed landscape here that preserves tunnel channels in a way that other sectors don't, but the, the subglacial process seems like it should be operating at the, at any valley that's connecting to the channel scabland, right? Yeah. And do Piedmont glaciers like that always, uh, make tunnel channel networks? I guess mm. you'd call that a Piedmont glacier. Anyway. Um, yeah. And just it's to just bring, awesome. um, the people who are excited to get out into the field back into it, these, these dots here are um, crystalline erratics in Moses Cooley. Those are the ones that we've dated with surface exposure dating, but they also tell us something about the source of the icebergs that brought those erratics into the Cooley. So, uh, uh, you know, something that Richard Waite has asked me about repeatedly is have you ever found a chunk of the belt Purcell argillite in Moses Cooley? to link the flood water to Montana? And my my answer is no, I have not. But if somebody could find that, if it's there, that would bring the Missoula floods back into the picture. What I've found is mainly rocks that match lithologies consistent with what the Okanagan lobe was eroding. Hey, I've yeah, got an I've got an idea. I've got an idea. So p people in the live chat are loving this map. Uh, Joel, do you have like one or two more, or is it just this one, really? This is the only map. The okay. other thing is the Calcrete stuff. Okay. Nick, so let, let's oh, yeah. we're, Viewers, we're going to do some live Q&A just looking at this map right now. And as you get your uppercase in, Jerome's got a few things to add.
but let's let's just try this because I think we can do a lot because this is a big moment and we haven't really addressed this directly in the series. So this is meat and potatoes and some very exciting stuff. So let's involve the live viewers. Jerome, you got a couple minutes worth of commentary before we get to the live questions? Yeah, not even two. Okay. Two things just to bring us back to the big question that you've tackled the last 25 episodes before 20. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the whole the whole story about blue ice in Spokane and the evidence for blue ice would be, you know, once we talk about Okanagan logo like that, showing a subglacial network of channels, what we'd love to see is the equivalent network transferred over to the Spokane Plains, right? That's essentially the argument that you would make for Brett's to say there's ice over that area delivering water right to the Scabland track, the head mm -hmm. of the Scabland tracks, mm -hmm. which we don't see. And we were, you were sort of humming and hawing about whether those channels from Chad Pritchard's paper were analogous yeah. to some of these channels as subglacial conduits. The difference is that, of course, that area has been swept by water, flood water from Lake Missoula very clearly because there's those big pet bed forms. The issue here is that this is not swept. This is the point we're making. It is not swept by floodwaters. And so there's no option for like erasing whatever glacial effects might have been there and replacing it with big bed forms and big gravel deposits from the floods themselves. It's very, very difficult to get water over the Waterville Plateau, that surface, during a drainage or multiple drainages of Missoula. And one of the key parts of this, and this goes back to your Brian Outwater video, is whether or not Grand Coulee is cut. Yes. Because if Grand Coulee is cut and not blocked by ice, water, like the word that's been used in paper is that Grand Coulee is a siphon. Water, you cannot raise Lake Columbia very high because Grand Coulee is pulling all the water through and diverting it. So it's even harder to get water to that high point. Thank but you very option, much. Go ahead. The option for subglacial water, when you see it on this lobe, as Joel was saying, well, is it that unreasonable to transfer it eastward to other lobes and no it wouldn't be unreasonable as long as there's evidence for the ice being there but here we do have it we have the moraine we have the channels thank you okay joel get your cursor ready let's do some geography a bunch of people are asking about where the hell is this place so where where is grand coulee on your use your cursor please i should have included an index map it, so okay. this is this is upper grand coulee steamboat rock is where it's this little um Thing here, my cursor okay. is on top, right next to it. And Moses Cooley is where, please? Here. Thank you. Where is uh, Lake Chelan and the town of Chelan? This is Lake Chelan. Okay, and- The town uh, is right there. Thank you. And where is Spokane, Washington, please? You're doing very well. It today. is, it's off the map. Okay, to the right. Yeah. Yeah. Over here somewhere. And where's Ellensburg? <laughs> Also off the map. Okay, <laughs> to the to the, well, to the lower left. left. The so we've got we've, yeah. we've we've got just a bit of Wenatchee. We've been talking about Wenatchee a fair amount lately. So Wenatchee's to the mm -hmm. lower left. Okay, good. There's not a lot of uh, human habitation on this map. Right. Yeah, man. Uh, okay. Let's. I'm just going to go rapid fire and let's just do some quick answers here. Uh, have the dots been dated? Asks Lon. Yes, that, that's what the dots are. They're sites of um, granite boulders or cobbles that we've dated using beryllium-10 and or aluminum-26 cosmogenic nuclides to tell us how long those rocks have been sitting in their present position. It's called surface exposure dating. Thank you. And those dates are yep. all, all red dates so far? Yeah, there's, there's one that's... 28,000 years and one that's 26,000 years, but okay. those can be explained by prior exposure of the rock. So if you think about a glacially transported boulders history, it may have started on a hill slope somewhere and then been entrained in the ice and then transported to its location. So it can start its, its glacial journey with some surface exposure. Most of them didn't, they were quarried subglacially and they had zero surface exposure prior to being entrained. Thank you. So Let's those keep... are those are outliers. Yep. Great. Uh, M. Peterson. Uh, Let's ask this one to Jerome. Jerome, what's the elevation change on the channels going uphill? 
Uh, tens to hundreds of meters, depending Thank on you. their length and where they are. Okay. Scott uh, uh, wonders, uh, back up to Lake Missoula. So he's seeing the light blue. Does that go all the way back to Lake Missoula? That's Lake uh, Columbia. That's Lake almost, Columbia. yeah. It's, this is Lake Columbia at its, its highest level. Okay. which only occurs either when the ice is filling Grand Coulee or when Grand Coulee doesn't exist. And at that level, it almost reaches to the ice dam, but not quite. Thank you. Uh, Pat Miller wonders, was the Columbia River Valley, as shown on the map, blocked by the ice? And under this configuration, the ice is filling the Columbia River Valley. So this is the margin of the ice, and everything to the north of that is under ice. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Uh, let's do a few more, and then we'll do what you guys want to do after this. But people are loving, well, somebody, I, I lost the question, but it was something like, which theory does this map disprove? Jerome? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, I think it's seriously, we, ser we need to seriously question the, the, the option of diverting water from Lake Missoula. It's basically showing it's very difficult to get water from Lake Missoula and Lake Columbia onto the Waterville and into Moses Coulee. It makes that really tricky. And that becomes a better explanation for Moses, for water into Moses Coulee. Another question. Are there any Canadian erratics in Moses Coulee, Joel? Yeah, I mean, it's when you find a, a, a rock, it's, it's not always obvious where exactly it came from because there's right. multiple sources. Um, but there are some unique rock types in Moses Cooley that um, I think could be very plausibly linked to some of the metamorphic core complexes to the north of the channeled Scabland. And there's several of those, um, but one of them is in is in the Okanagan drainage. So there's a, a Augen gneiss and porphyritic granites that are pretty unique rock types in Moses Cooley. And then there's a, a quartzite in Moses Cooley that has garnet in it. Hmm. And so garnet is a higher grade metamorphic mineral that I've, I've talked to the sky about this. Could the quartzite be coming from the belt Purcell supergroup? Not if it has garnet in it, because that's a low grade quartzite. Thank you. So clues, clues, yes. but not definitive. Okay. Let's do one more question, which I've seen three times from three different people. And then we'll get off of this map and maybe even come back to the four heads. But, um, Three different people say, hey, what would Brett's map look like if you overlaid it on top of this thing? So I, yeah, I did that in one of my presentations. Um, well, it was, I don't know if it was Brett's map, but it, uh, Waters had a map of the Waterville Plateau. Okay. And there's just nothing on it. It's just blank. And then Hansen filled in this area and Hansen mapped all of these moraines and some of these eskers. And then it sat like that for huh. 50 years. Huh. Um, Dory Kovanen made another very nice geomorphic map, um, but she didn't really deal with the channels. Okay, I've so got... So it was yeah. Google Earth for me that... It, I mean, it's not that I was special, but it's that I came around at a time where I had the, this technology to, to do mapping at a, at, a, at a level of detail that people couldn't have done before. You can't map this stuff effectively from the ground. It's just not, it's just not possible. I think you're special, Joel. Ah. I think you're special. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, let's, let's try a couple more slides from Joel, and then we'll get back to four heads and see what, how, where we want to go from here. Thank you. That was fun. Thank you, viewers, for your questions. We'll probably have another round of questions a little bit later. Joel, what do you got? What else you got besides this one? Okay. So, um, you know, a big question that you've been hitting on again and again and again is what is the antiquity of this landscape? How old are the coolies in the channeled scab land? And um, we can't really date the coolies themselves, but there are deposits within them that are old. Mm. And so what you're looking at here. Um, and this slide is a view into Moses Cooley. It's in the it's in the background here, and we're on the margin of the flood swept part of Moses Cooley. We're in a side 
tributary called Coyote Creek that drains into Cooley, into the Cooley. And this is a flood gravel bar. And uh, the top part of the bar is MIS-2 flood gravel. That's this gray stuff. Under that is less of an undeterminate age. And under that, even older, is you can see this white band at the base of the flood bar. Mm. I don't know if the viewers have the detail to see that, mm -hmm. but these are close-ups of what that looks like. And it's a gravel upon which a calcrete soil has developed. And that tells us that it's an old feature. It's an old deposit. We don't know how old, um, but probably hundreds of thousands of years old. And so the question then becomes, what is this gravel? Is it an old flood gravel or is it a stream gravel from Coyote Creek, which drains flash floods and does transport sand and potentially gravel at times? Um, and then what kind of surface is it on? Is it on a flood scoured surface or is it on um, a pre-flood, pre-glacial surface? Very good. Thank you. Very um, helpful. So just to, just to give, I just want to show a couple other slides to give some good. context of where this is. Great. So here's a, a Google Earth image looking at um, to the north of, in Moses Cooley, and you can see the inner channel here. And then this, the upper part of Moses Cooley broadens out into a zone of flood swept channeled scab land. And this surface is, this gravel is kind of on the margin of that higher surface. So I'm just going to show you a elevation profile on this white line to see where this, this gravel is on the landscape. So this is an elevation profile on that line going across Moses Cooley. Mm -hmm. So here's the, the inner Cooley, and you can see that the, the Coyote Creek gravel is not in that part of the Cooley. So it doesn't tell us anything about when this clear Cooley formed, but it is on this flood scoured surface. So possibly it's telling us that this, this surface is much older. It's kind of, it's again, one of these kind of tantalizing clues that there's an older landscape here, but it's difficult to interpret. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. We, we skipped the thing. We skipped something or assumed everybody knew, but uh, yeah. Moses Cooley has always been problematic. Always. Well, yeah, let's, uh, Salis all, Joel Salisbury, can, can we get out of this? Thank you for bringing some slides, Joel. Thank you. Uh, yeah, can we comment on Mo Moses Cooley being problematic? That's important here. And then Joel, uh, Jerome, maybe also, why is everybody so obsessed with when Grand Cooley got cut? And, and Sky can add to that as well. So Moses Cooley, uh, Jerome, please. So problematic in the sense, difficult to explain. Difficult to explain because it's the, of the, the major sort of Cooley systems and flood tracks. It's the one that has the least clear connectivity to the other flood routes or basins or, or sources of water, right? It's kind of isolated on top of the Waterville Plateau without a clear connection. If you look at the Grand Coulee, it's pretty clear how it connects. Moses doesn't. It makes you, it makes you wonder why the old timers didn't spend a lot more time there. If, if this is the only one that's not connecting to the Columbia, why wouldn't you just be covering that on your hands and knees? Because how many old timers were there? Like the only old timer is Brett's really, who spent significant amounts of time. The old timers before Brett's noted it and they all kind of said, it must be part of a, an ancestral river system just because it's so big. Uh, you know, some of these early, early Simmons papers that people have visited, those, they saw it. They, they rode across it on the way to Grand Coulee. They recognized the similarities between them. And they said, that's a funny looking one because it just sort of rises gently to the top of the surface, the plateau, and then it disappears. Huh. But, you know, who knows? You know, it, it, it's okay. one of those, you know, they were doing reconnaissance work, flying through there, you know, and, and passing through, really, not staying. Brett's recognized the problem, um, came up with explanations that involve presence of ice nearby. In fact, two ice margins a bit further south and, you know, two positions, blue and red. Um, 
but the full explanation wasn't sort of always satisfactory. But I think, you know, I think the last show we did, the whole episode in BC is looking for volcanism under the ice to generate water. He's in the Okanagan. He's already got that sniffed out as being a big gutter with places where you could generate water. And where does it go? Well, it goes into the Columbia River for sure. But then with the subglacial component, you can get it on top of that that high surface, the water bill, and then, as we're showing, funneling it into Moses Cooley. But there's been an enigma about an enigma. Moses Cooley. That's the and word. That's, it keeps coming up. And that's the connectivity to the rest, to other flood routes, right? This is the real crux of it is it is not connected sufficiently well to allow for, you know, clear, obvious passage of water through there, unless yeah. you think about the water some, you know, in a different way. Can I, can I yeah. comment on it? So, yeah, like Jerome says, the first round of guys, there's like 10 people who came through on horseback, essentially, and said, oh, look at that. That's weird. That's Moses Cooley. Huh, weird. And then Brett's comes through, and he goes, yeah, that's weird. But then proposes a like, well, if that, then this. And he propose, he takes it a next step further, right? He's a better, he's a clearer thinker. He's He's got a different motivation. He's just a better geologist probably than a lot of those guys. And then what Joel said earlier, he said, I was about to write something up, but I realized I hadn't really looked. And it's that point, as a geologist, you have to go, oh, shit, this is going to require work. This is going to require a different approach to what I'm doing. And now do I have enough time? Do I am I going to go down this road? Am I going to be honest about what I just what the epiphany I just had? And I remember a couple, like a year ago or two years ago, I can't remember when I first kind of talked to you, you were just kind of starting on this channel stuff and you were a little hesitant. You're like, yeah, Larry's done this stuff. And then, ah, but the fact that you said, I don't know if I really know what I'm talking about and did work to get over that hump is that is, that is field geology, that is geology, right? You didn't massage a narrative. You did the heavy lifting, and it's that that always gets respect, that always brings like notoriety. That's how you make leaps forward in, in geology, is to be honest with yourself and do the work. Jim O'Connor is pointing out that, in, in fairness, Larry Hansen is the person who probably did the most amount of work on the Mansfield channels and that Moses Cooley uh, prior to this this work, I guess, uh, I'm, I skipped over it, but it, it is in fact the most significant amount of like deep thinking about connections to Moses Cooley and, and strange channel patterns. That was Larry Hansen's thesis. If Larry Thank Hansen, if Larry Hansen was still with us, he's passed away. But if he was able to join us, uh, do you have any guess what he would be most excited about with your current work in this paper that's about to come out? Did he have some? instincts that you guys are following through on impossible Joel? question to answer <laughs> Joel? yeah i mean i think because he, he he did a lot of remote sensing as well he used air photos and i think he would just be excited about the fact that google earth is like air photos on steroids and that you know we were we were able to take his work a step further i mean that was another, th- I mean, um, when I saw his map of all these recessional moraines, I just thought that that looks too beautiful to be true. So I, I verified it with <laughs> Google Earth, but indeed everything he saw was 100% accurate. And he was he was looking at photographs, not, not on a computer, but, and then translating that into a map. I mean, the, the work he did was incredible, so. You know, he he paved the way 100 percent for just doing just doing the same thing with new methods, new text, new technology. Thank you. Uh, anybody. Uh, why is the timing of opening Grand Coulee to bring it back to Brian Atwater and, and that clip that I shared at the beginning? Why is the excavation of Grand Coulee? such an important question. Why is it such a, a apparently a linchpin for viewing the entire scab lands when, once you dig out the upper Grand Coulee? Jerome, you want to start us? 
feel like I'm talking all the time. Sky? Somebody else can, yeah. It's by far the lowest divide out of the Columbia Valley. So if it's open, it's, it's, it's like this just low, huge outlet for water from Glacial Lake Columbia. And so it, it results in a much lower lake level in Glacial Lake Columbia, and it makes it really difficult to get flood water onto the Waterville Plateau into Moses Cooley when it's open to its present depth. So yeah. that means so that means if we want to go nuts with Missoula floods, and we've got uh, a baker's dozen Missoula floods coming over Spokane, Missoula flood water now. Uh, we just lost Sky. Hopefully he can come back. Uh, that water's once you open Grand Coulee, it do, do you guys imagine it's very difficult to get that Missoula water into the Cheney Palouse? Is that the concept? The Cheney Palouse is is closer to the flood source, so yeah. the, the surf flood water surface is higher there, naturally. So I don't I don't know how much of a control Grand Coulee exerts on the flood height there. That would be stop talking. Well, Sky, I, I think, or Jerome. I, oh, yeah, I think part of the part of the you know you have to sort of visualize, but if you think of Columbia as a great big bucket, Grand Coulee is basically a big hole at the bottom of the bucket. So if the if the hole's not plugged, the bucket leaks, and so you can't you can't fill the bucket fast. You can't raise the water surface. So you're asking about what happens closer to the source. Part of the issue I think is that we visualize these floods coming in, and we just think of a water surface rising. You know, you just sort of rise the water surface. In reality, these would be like a wave, right? There's a bore coming in, and so um, can there be water overspilling in some places? Yeah, because it's not simply just a gradual rising of water. There's, you know, a wave effectively propagating. But beyond that initial wave, I think that's the way I sort of often think of it. Um, if Grand Coulee is open, water gets diverted down the Grand Coulee. In other words, the Grand, Grand Coulee operates as a as a pathway for water, and it's very difficult to raise the lake level in Glacial Lake Columbia much above the floor of Grand Coulee. Right? It becomes basically a limit to how high you can raise the lake. Unless, of course, you block it with ice. That's what will happen. That's yeah. word for word what Atwater was saying in October when we're out there. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. And so if you can't if you can't raise if you can't raise the level of Glacial Lake Columbia um, past much past, you know, well above its current elevation, its floor, then the diversion of water is almost impossible. Huh. And yeah, so, so it's, that, a, it's a critical thing. It's a critical thing. And I think you might start questioning whether you can spill into, you know, spill lots of water for long periods of time through the other scavenger tracks. Sorry, Joel. Yeah, I'm just looking at the chat. Jim says that Cheney Palouse gets flooded no matter the situation with yeah. Grand Coulee. Yeah. The Bruce Bjornstad says something that seems to be the opposite. Um, <laughs> but the, the point is that it's, you know, the Lake Missoula level is up at 1,200 something meters. Is that right? And so the water surface is dipping is yeah. dropping downstream and so because you're close to that high lake level source grand coulee which is much further downstream is less important for the the height of the water at the entrance to cheney palouse but it's really really critical for getting water into moses coulee when grand coulee is fully open you just can't come up with a scenario that routes significant amounts of flood water from missoula into moses coulee well, throwing all the way back to early in the alphabet, and Sky, welcome back. You get your blood pressure down. We're good. I mean, it was, I think it was, it was Sky's show and maybe Jerome's show before Thanksgiving. I was wondering, why do we have coolies in the West and not coolies in the Cheney Palouse, for instance? And then I think we were kind of, whether it was right or wrong, going into the idea that we had major river canyons before the Ice Age, controlled by the Yakima full belt and, and uh, pre-glacial valleys and all that, and that you're just scouring out V-shaped valleys, essentially, as opposed to, you know, starting these valleys from scratch. And I'm not exactly sure that's right anymore after I read some of the upper Grand Coulee stuff from Brett's, but where are we currently, you guys, thinking about why these monster coolies, Grand and Moses, are in the west, and why don't we have those further east? Is it really tied to the the 
anticlines that preexisted the Ice Age? Sky, you want to join in? Are you yeah. functional? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, good. Well, I think that the, those folds are controlling in a lot of ways, but then you see, I think I made a little map a while ago. I think floods traverse like a dozen anticlines, right? So the flood coolies are cutting across east-west anticlines all across the whole Columbia Plateau. So those are older drainages, antecedent drainages, and it's got to be that there was a stream down Moses Cooley. There was a stream down uh, Grand Cooley prior to canyon cutting by floods or, or glacial ice. There, there had to be, whether it was right there or not, I don't know. But fractured basalt and seems like those folds control quite a bit, especially maybe in the north. Um, we're up there north of Pinto Ridge. That, that area seems to be more north-south control on the folds than farther south, like well, that, by the Yakima area. That's a, that's a good example. Like, I was in love with that idea of all these major coolies are pre-glacial valleys that are then scoured out, and yet I get to the 1930s with Brits, and he's like, hey, man, we got a pre-glacial valley uh, to the east of Lower Grand Coulee, and there is no valley where the true lower Grand Coulee is today, and you're you're making the lower Grand Coulee from scratch, basically, where the pre-glacial V-shape is on the other side of the Great Blade. I, so it's not as simple as I want it to be, I don't think, as far as, as following yeah. these, these, these older valleys. No, and I think people are trying to get at that maybe with reconstructing that landscape and looking at iso like a isostatic rebound, post-glacial rebound, maybe would change our picture of things. I, I, that landscape evolution comes back. I mean, this is a perfect laboratory for testing some of those physical models on a landscape that just happens to be a flood landscape, but future research can, can figure that. Okay, um, thank you. Can I add that one, one last thing? Or Please. one small thing? Please. Um, the Grand Coulee isn't just about Moses Coulee, right? And it, like Grand Coulee, if open or, or closed, eroded or not, or to what degree it's eroded, also controls what gets into the Columbia at different times. So there's a story, and Brett's, Richard Waite spoke about the fact that he figured out or he realized there was a bit of a gap in terms of what was happening between Wenatchee and the Okanagan, and he focused on that area. Brett's had flagged that area as an area of interest, saying there's some interesting features and bars, and it's really deeply incised, and that needs a look. Um, if you want to get water flowing through the Columbia, prior to the Okanagan low blocking the Columbia River, difficult to do with spills of Missoula if the Grand Coulee is open. Much easier if it's closed or not eroded all the way down to where it is today. Mm. So that passage is not available, and so all the water has to go and follow the Columbia. Let's fast forward to retreat of the lobe. So once the lobe has moved over the Columbia, blocked the Columbia River, moved onto the Waterville Plateau or the Withrow Moraine, at that point, it's also blocking the Grand Coulee in whatever state it, it might be. Um, when it retreats, it reopens the Columbia, and there's water that then follows, drains through the Columbia again. But Brian Outwater, in that some of those videos this fall, said, you know, how much water is actually left in Lake Columbia at that point to actually go down and create some of the flood features? Huh. So it ties into those big questions from Brett. It ties into the, the timing that we reconstruct, the relative timing that we reconstruct. Uh, it ties into the potential for additional sources of water from other places. And so if you look at the Columbia, the Columbia and the Okanagan are basically lined up. Uh, and if, if we're making a case that there's water coming down the Okanagan in whatever form, there's also gonna be water coming down the Okanagan during deglaciation. Yeah. And there are potentially other sources, and I'm not the first one to say this, and Richard Wade has argued that there's a Lake Kootenai Lake that basically Kootenai that can drain to the Columbia, but there are other gutters that can operate quite efficiently in moving water. So the status of Grand Coulee and the dynamics around that that gate, you know, that the, the blockages and the timing in those blockages are really critical because of it has repercussions on how we understand flow of water, landscape evolution, relative timing of different features. Uh, if we now open the, 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 the possibilities for other sources of water. So it's a critical, critical question that's really tough to resolve right now is what is the status of Grand Coulee in the red times? 
Let's yeah, do what, go ahead, Sky. Larry's work, just quickly, Larry's work, Larry Smith's work in Western Montana on Glacial Lake Missoula uh, bottom sediments is showing that there's not, uh, well, we're kind of closing the door on some of the op opportunities for Glacial Lake Missoula to contribute water over the long term. We know it did during the last glacial, but pre-late Wisconsin contributions from Glacial Lake Missoula are not well in hand. And Larry's work would argue that there was one Glacial Lake Missoula and it drained mostly or partially a bunch of times, but that lake didn't form during Bull Lake time or, or in older glaciations. Anyway, we're kind of approaching some constraints on Glacial Lake Missoula as a reservoir for Scabland water. Well, that's one of the biggest narratives of this winter, trying not to push it, but continuing to wonder. And I guess I'll ask you guys, and then viewers were coming to you. I know you've been wait patient. Thank you. You will. You please feel free to ask any question to any of these guys. If it's a specific question for a person, in uppercase, viewers, please go ahead and type it now. Uh, Joel, then this question. Jerome, this question. We'll make sure to get the questions to the right people. I think they can all see your questions as well. So I'll just let these guys do live Q and A on their own. I got to go do an intermission myself. I've been drinking too much water. Uh, um, let's, let's go ahead, Jerome. Well, I was going to no, ask, just to, just to yeah. follow up Sky, but go ahead. I don't want to interrupt you, but, go ahead. um, you know, the show with Larry was really interesting because this is one of these loose threads or incompatibilities that is raising new questions. On one side, there, there are some interpretation. Well, we have breadth with a few floods. We have now more of a narrative around multiple floods to the tune of many dozens. And yet Larry Smith is telling us you know, a handful maybe, or a couple handfuls of Lake Missoula exposure, so not full drainages. So putting some limits on how much water is actually escaping from Lake Missoula, um, can we generate that sedimentary record of multiple individual floods raising to 40 or more without having clear evidence of 40 drainages? And what's the magnitude of the drainages that do occur that Larry can document? And so I'm not sure that they're necessarily incompatible, but there's certainly a discrepancy there and it's not a straight across 40 to 40. It's not, it's, or whatever the number is going to be. Um, so again, just more work to be done. And again, I'll go back to the list because I really like Brett's list, but Brett's had, and his shopping list of things to do, had the sediments of Lake Missoula. And the sediments of Lake Missoula, as Larry Smith has shown, is a combination of lacustrine sediments, the Nine Mile and the rail line and so forth, but also essentially flood deposits in a lake basin, the big, big gravel bars that underlie those finer, calmer, lower energy lacustrine sediments that tell a very different story about the dynamics of Lake Missoula. They tell a drainage of the lake story, very energetic, um, and then subsequent exposure of that lake floor at some moments, but not, not so far anyways, not the number of exposures that matches the number of inferred floods from the sedimentary record elsewhere. So. Uh wide open in terms of interesting questions to tackle from my standpoint. Thank you. Thank you. Joel, can you be the moderator for a few minutes? I got to go across the hall. Can you uh, read a couple of live questions for folks and, and answer mm -hmm. them or pound them off? I'll be back in a few minutes. Thanks, you guys. All right. So uh, one question is from Lindsay Malone. How would how would you guys reframe the public narrative on the Ice Age floods? I love that question. Yeah. yeah, Lindsay's always got good questions. She does. Jerome, do you have something teed up? Oh, yeah. No. Um, <laughs> well, how would I reframe? I mean, it has to be reframed as like any major scientific endeavor. It's Is it ever over? And in the sense that there are always questions to ask, but I think more than ever or with new tools new technologies and new people that come and ask questions you realize how many interesting open questions there are so new eyes new tools raise new questions yeah i i think if i were going to add one thing to the you know the popular narrative is to expand on what we've been talking about is that blue record whatever that means the pre-last glacial there's not only an older landscape 
but there's an older Luss record. Mm -hmm. There's an older Cooley record. There's an older Gravel record, but and and possibly there's a buried um, story in Northwest Montana and North Northern Idaho that's really not received a whole lot of attention at all. So if I were going to add something to the Missoula flood narrative, it's to say that these floods not only exploited a pre-glacial drainage system, as everybody, Flint, Bretts, everybody has said, but they probably exploited a pre-conditioned flood landscape, glacial, glacial flood landscape that we don't fully understand, but that seems to provide mm -hmm. some of the topography that both glacial ice and floods followed during the last glacial. And that's not a small thing, and it usually is two paragraphs in books. You know, It's a small part of the literature, but I think it's a big part of the channeling of, of the scab land. So, so to instead of telling it as a series of catastrophic events that created the landscape, it's to frame it as a longer, multi-million year history of of landscape development and yeah, to start with geologic what, history. Yeah, start with your your mm -hmm. your wiggle curves of glaciations of those mega glacials and and minor glacials, and start to say you know logically we can't have one. We have to have multiple, and then just to just to say, you start with a preconditioned landscape, a, a fluvial landscape, and then it goes through a couple cycles of scabland flooding. But that that first cycle is not well understood, but it's important. Mm -hmm. All right, this one is kind of directed to you, Sky, but anybody can handle it. And uh, will you be exploring gutters above Lake Missoula? <laughs> above Lake Missoula. I probably won't. I'm I'm stuck um, a little farther south here along the margin in the Mission Valley for the time being. I'm hoping to get my map published or publishable condition, at least a draft by this summer of the Mission Valley. And it's like 12 quads. So it's a hell of a lot of work for me uh, just at night. So I am not going north. I think I'm tempted to go to the Pond Array. The Ponderay is interesting, and some of the Clark Fork uh, areas along like Thompson Falls. Those are places that are really interesting because they have deposits and landforms that are so obvious. But no, probably won't be working to the north. But you keep sending me these giant current ripples that had to come <laughs> from somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you produce a map of that, Joel. I hope you get yeah. a compilation, maybe a living document, like much like Glenn. Uh, has done in Google Earth just to have points that expands every year. I I think that's hugely valuable. Mm -hmm. uh, it's approaching the top of the hour. My goal is to get you guys uh, on your way in 10 minutes. So um, you want to do a few more questions? Does anything else grab your eye? And then we'll and then we'll uh, thank you guys for all of your time today. Yeah, um, I want to give this one to, to that's directed at Jerome, which okay. is what is the most important thing you have learned from this A to Z series? Ah, hmm. uh, wow. Well, there's a lot of things. I mean, one thing I don't know about learn, but something that really stuck sticks out for me is a how amazing that the collaboration with people has been. That's been a really um, everybody has spoken to this, but I'll just say it again because it really truly has been incredible. And unforeseen, that's the other really, uh, one of those surprises or, you know, happenstance, the timing and the facilitating. Uh, beyond that, but related to it in terms of all the correspondence that was unearthed, I am just still even more just amazed with Brett's. I just, I just, I really, you know, whatever science is done by people with personalities and whatever beef he and Flint may have had, whatever it is, um, that's just part of the person. But uh just so clever so uh profoundly gifted at at observational like observational skills and his, his ability to describe landscapes richard Waite said you know you can take a brett's paper and go to the location it's like you have a voice there's a voice over the over what your eyes are seeing and uh this is done at a time when 
There are no air photos when he's doing the work. They're barely topographic maps. And he has an eye to read the landscape and a landscape that is completely out of scale for what you would normally see. He is kind of imagining to a degree, but he's seeing features and envisaging the relationships over a landscape that is kind of extraterrestrial. You know, it's, it's not, it, there, are, there are very few places you can sort of observe those features and recognize them. And he's doing it all from the ground. And the scale is a challenge because those features are so big. That, that speaks to so much cleverness and intellect and ability to do that and putting a story the way he's put that story together. That again, today still holds in many respects. Uh, the foundation is still there. It's largely unshakable. And where you can poke holes at it, it's about timing. And it's about, it's, it's because we resolve it with tools that he never had. And so that to me, even in the correspondence that comes through even more clearly in terms of what he sees in his field notes, just amazing, amazing. And that word's overused, but really is for, for Brits. And Nick, before you kick us off, can we throw yeah. that question at you? What have yeah. you learned? And um, we were talking yesterday, if, I, I was curious if you, learned, if you learned anything about how science works, but you can answer it however you want. What's the Thank most you. important thing you've learned? I, I didn't know where we were going to go at the beginning of the alphabet, and I was curious about what motivated mm -hmm. Brett and who influenced him and how much of a copycat he was. And I think in some cases he was strongly influenced by Russell, a little bit by Willis, and, and so and Chamberlain, and Salisbury, I think. So to me, it was uh, an interesting lesson in even this most brilliant guy was trained by somebody and was strongly imprinted by some folks. And he was ahead of his time, but I think he was also of his time. And in a way, the last 50 years is a different time, and it feels like it's not emphasizing some of the major relationships that were established back then. So um, I think I, I'm happy that I spent as much time as we did uh, before Christmas on those earlier influences. It felt like I was just stalling and didn't want to get to the Scablands, but I, I really did learn a lot from that and really enjoyed all those influences, big and small with Brett's himself. Thank you for the question, Joel. Can I ask Joel and Skye, their, whatever the question was from the viewer, thank you. What did you learn this winter or what stands out? Or however you want to answer it, that'll be the way we'll finish, I think. Uh, Skye, what do you want to, you want to put a little bow on, on your thoughts from this winter? Yeah, yeah, I think the thing I take away is um, roles, the different roles that geologists play and so if the goal is to communicate good ideas and to sort of, you know, tamp down the bad ones and sort of self-police, but also get something out there that matters to larger society, you need a, di a bunch of different kind of people. You know, you need sort of the dorks like me that go out and do stuff in the field and, and sort, of are, sort of hermits, you know. You need those people that are just out there plugging away, doing, doing work. And then you need people that can synthesize and turn a phrase. I think Vic Baker is a really good, uh, he's such a good writer. You just, he just sort of sings along and everything he writes, you go, yeah, I buy it. Okay. And then you need people like you, Nick, that are bringing together a lot of different people and can work across platforms, right? You're, you're accessible to everybody. Those are huge. I think what, what Thomas Large did for Brett's, you're doing for a bigger community, a much larger, a hundred times that community. And then really the people that have, you've mm. crowdsourced all this information. I mean, holy cow. I, I just, I hope, I hope something comes uh, packaged from, you know, a bibliography of discovery. Uh, these are the things that we put forth in this series and the people that did it, their names on there, their names and pictures on there, because those those uh, findings and all that hard work from Glenn and your folks and Eugene and all, I mean, such important things. So the different roles come, come forward. And I think the last thing is those roles change over time. 
and we saw Brett's accept his older age. And we saw, we see Flint doing it, although he's not as verbose about sort of his role. We see him enter a different stage in his career. And I think those things are important to remember as geologists, mm. that as we get older, our roles change. And I think my frustration with the folks that have done flood research is when their roles don't change. And they sort of see themselves as that 28 year old out in the field when, you know, maybe you're not 28 anymore. You need to understand that there's a, a bigger a bigger world out there that's moving by. So the different roles in geology, I think, have been something I really have taken away from this 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 series. It's just been terrific. Thank you, Sky. Joel, final thoughts. I, I was going to say something similar, but I mean, you know, a huge thing I learned was that that people actually care about this. I was in my windowless, airless office, <laughs> and I didn't know that. I mean, I was <laughs> I was laboring in obscurity, so to speak. And when you invited me to do a video in the field and then to present work at CWU and then to appear on this series, it completely changed my conception of myself and what I was doing, and it made me care like i mean I, I did lose motivation at multiple points during my dissertation because this work is not easy and it's not there's not immediate rewards to it so to have the community of people who actually are interested and in following and care has been just transformative for my life and so thank you to the viewers thank you to nick Thank you to Jerome and Sky. You, like I said before, you've been incredible mentors to me. And as to the roles changing, that's sort of my goal moving forward is to try to be that mentor for someone else. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Joel. Did you mention your new job? I did not. Um, in a couple of weeks, I'm starting a position as a publications editor at the Washington Geological Survey. So I'll be taking a step away from research and more into what I see as a service job of serving the, the people and the economy of Washington and presenting information. So I'll be um, continuing to do some of this research stuff on the side, but it's a new role for me. Um, and yeah, thank you for awesome. helping me get there. Yeah. yeah. Congratulations, awesome. congratulations. Well, can I can I add one last thing? Yeah, man. A, a repeat, a repeat of what we said at the start Good. is there's a lot of fertile ground in the scablands in Washington around these stories. That story is not over. There are floods that come out after Lake Missoula. We're all all three of us are sort of working on some of those things. But if there are students, whether they have classes that deal with scablands or don't or are curious, like there's room for everybody. And then some, and you don't even necessarily have to be a field geologist. We see with Glenn, with Dan Co, the importance of LIDAR and the ability to, 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 to interpret LIDAR, but there's far more you can do with these data sets. Um, there are skills that can be applied to these problems in all kinds of ways, engineers with modeling and geochronologists. And I mean, it's wide open, wide open. Um, and it's not just restricted to the, the, the big coolies or the, the known places. I think the, area of flooding that continues after Missoula expands the areas that become part of the story. And so there's literally and physically room for for, for everyone mm. if people are interested. And so hopefully people are aware of this and the, me the message passes on because it's just a fascinating place. I mean, all three, all four and whatever thousands of people, it's a fascinating landscape. It just grabs you. It, it, it you know, it, it, it motivates you in funny ways to explain this landscape for a bunch of reasons. And we're all, as Sky said, kind of nerds doing this, and this is a platform for nerds. But ultimately, that's what drives us, is that curiosity and, and being able to communicate, communicate that is great. But if people want to go further, there is lots to do. Yeah, reach out, reach out to us. Yeah. Yeah. Beautifully done, beautifully said, bravo performance. Thank you guys so much. We're going to end our Zoom call, and I'm going to go on to these big surprises that I've got that I don't think you guys know about either. So maybe you'll watch 
for another few minutes. But you can do what you want, man. It's Friday, Sunday. Go out and enjoy the sunshine or whatever. <laughs> Thanks to all three of you guys so much for the whole series and today. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Goodbye, you guys. Everybody. Okay. You see, you. Jerome. see ya. See you guys. Well, let's give you a shout out the window until I get myself organized here. Well, who was that? That was Jerome Lesman at Vancouver Island University in Nanaimo, British Columbia. That was Sky Cooley in the Mission Valley of Montana. And that was Joel Gombiner, newly of the Washington Geological Survey. Big fans of all three of those guys. And I know that many of you are too. They're old friends by now. They've been on this series so much. Okay, well, we are about done, but if you're just joining us or didn't catch the beginning of the show, I teased the episode and said, when we're done with those three guys live, I have two rather significant surprises that materialized in my email inbox yesterday. So that's what we're going to do. Those two surprises. Uh, and then we'll wrap up the series and talk a little bit about what's next on the YouTube channel. Okay, so how am I going to do this? Go to the slideshow, close Zoom. That worked out. These three guys, yes, this is a photo where all three of these guys were in Ellensburg last spring. Uh, I had each of them give talks uh, here at the geology department at CWU, hosted by Hannah Shamlu and myself. And so Joel and, uh, and J Joel and Jerome were out doing field work, and then they timed it so that they could hear Sky's talk on a Friday at noon, and then we all went out to the tab. This is this episode, Nick, from the classroom uh, office, brought to you by the tab in beautiful downtown Ellensburg. You've got to love it. So what's next? How am I going to do this? All right. Well, make it easy for myself. Surprise number one. All right, so here's the story. It involves Bija the cat. All right, so is this a photo of Bija the cat this morning at 4 a.m.? It is not. It's dark at 4 in the morning here. So it's Sunday morning. I pretty much finished preparing for today uh, about, I don't know, 8 o'clock or something last night watched the Badger basketball game on replay, and then went to bed. And at 4 o'clock this morning, for reasons I don't understand, it's not typical, Bijou the cat in our house started scratching like crazy on our door and meowing and meowing and meowing. 4 in the morning. I couldn't get back to sleep, so I went out to see what he wanted, and he wanted to go outside, and then he wanted food, and then he wanted to be held, and then he was wanted to go outside again. It's like, oh, my God. So I was up for good at 4 o'clock. So what am I going to do at 4 o'clock? I guess I'll check the email. And there were dozens of emails that came in late last night. And many of them were from a fellow named Brian in Portland. And he was not only emailing me, he was also copying Glenn from Spokane. So Brian has been a regular viewer. He's probably in the live chat right now. Brian, I'm going to bust your cover. This is Brian, the great-grandson of Thomas Large. This is Brian from Portland, Oregon, who might be able to identify himself. I think his handle in the live chat is xstash or something like that. So Brian... I think more than 20 years ago, got very interested in his great-grandpa, Thomas Large, and Brian started doing his own research. And he got, at some point, to the field notes of Joseph Pardee. I don't, I don't have more than that, except Brian yesterday decided he was going to, once and for all, look for those copies or notes that he took 
let's say, 25 years ago, when he got to Joseph Pardee's notes from 1920, 1921, 1922, an integral part of our story. Because you remember Christmas time or whatever it was, January last month, we had Thomas Large from Spokane, Lewis and Clark High School, inviting both Joseph Pardee and J. Harlan Bretsch to Spokane to do some work. And nobody knew how to find any of the notes of Joseph Pardee. Well, we have them. We have parts of them now. So why did he include Glenn? Because he email, Brian emails Glenn at like, I don't know what it was, 7 o'clock last night. And he's like, maybe you can whip something. <laughs> Brian's like, here's, here's some of the stuff I have from the Pardee notes. Glenn, we got just a few hours before the session Z. You, you mind uh, trying to do something with all these Pardee notes and do a Google Earth by Glenn with Pardee? So what did I discover this morning? All these emails from Brian. All these emails from Glenn. And yeah, there's a link right down below. Of course, the description of the episode. And there's the My Maps by Glenn. And there's a new one that says Pardee. And as of a few hours ago, Glenn hustled until after midnight to put the Pardee stuff on Google Earth and my maps. So let me give you a little sample. Joseph Pardee, there's a couple major curves to our narrative from Brian's discovery in his freaking garage or whatever. So Brian literally just sent some like snapshots with his iPhone from some binders or something. Again, we'll make it up 25 years ago. This transcript by Brian of J.T. Party Field Notes is offered with the hope that it will be used as a reference only after being compared to the handwritten original. Department of Interior, USGS, Geological Records, J. Pard J. T. Pardee. October 10th, 1920. Well, hold on. Wait a minute now. I thought large started teaching high school in Spokane in late summer of 1921. And I thought the story was almost immediately Pardee writes letters to get some professional opinions. Pardee was here in 1920? A full year before he knew about Thomas Large? Am I off on the chronology? Or is our story about Thomas Large inviting Pardee to Spokane, erroneous. Because here he is in the fall of 1920, and he's writing sketches, and this is Brian typing up some handwritten notes, so I don't know if we have the handwritten stuff scanned or not. Here's Joseph Pardee in the fall of 1920, screwing around at Davenport on the Sunset Highway, dealing, thinking about the, this is long before J. Harlan, this is two summers before, Brett starts coming to the to the scab lands. Uh, this is Pardee in 1921. I'm just giving you little snaps. Like I, I truly just grabbed a few things off of the emails that I saw this morning at, at five in the morning. Uh, Pardee, 1922, going to Wilbur in Odessa. I don't even know what month we're in now. Pardee's in Mansfield. He's at the Mondovi Horseshoe, for crying out loud. <laughs> Joseph Pardee, in the fall of 1920, is making sketches of the west wall of the Grand Coulee. He's at Steamboat Rock. Here's one of the walls of the upper Grand Coulee. If you've been following along, this is an exciting new discovery that potentially will be fleshed out in the coming weeks after our series is done. So here's Brian himself in one of the emails. The TypeScript field notes from 1920 are from his actual handwritten notebook. They are my transcription with scans of his sketches inserted at the same place as his notes. I do have third generation copies of the 1920 notes if someone can better parse his handwriting than I can. 
1922 field notes, and that is, so if you're losing it, the story we told this winter and the story that's been told by many over the past 50 years is that Pardee did a little bit of field work in 1921 on his own, did a little bit of field work in the early part of the summer of 1922, and then Brett shows up in August of 22, and they never meet. And then it's a mystery as to what Pardee was able to find. And did Pardee stumble into this Scablands and Ice Age flood story and have a bunch of things figured out but then was suppressed by his boss, Alden? Pardee was at the ambush meeting, if you recall. So this is fertile ground here at the very end of episode Z. Who knows how much further we will go? This is still Brian, the great-grandson of Thomas Large. The 22 notes have a USGS library number, but they are missing. At least the 1990s they were missing. The daily, oh, so this is 30 years ago Brian is doing this. I'll let you read this. I guess I won't do it all here. This is a small notebook. I believe were office notes. I imagine that just as Thomas Large was tracing out his Lake Spokane on the USGS topo map, Pardee was doing the same. And Brian says, I'm pissed off. I can't find my photocopies of the journal, but I'll keep looking. Nice things. Um, more of the same. Okay, this is from 21. Some highlights according to Brian. Pardee's taking trains. Meisner's coming in by train. He's with the Aldens, a couple, his boss and his wife, I guess, for two weeks. Joseph Pardee goes to a baseball game. Some field assistant gets stung by bees. Pardee has a fainting spell. He's not feeling well. June 25th, 1922, he takes Thomas Large to Sprague, the little town of Sprague and back in Sprague Lake. So Pardee is, come on, man. I don't know how much of this will be fleshed out in the next two months, but if we really look carefully at these Pardee notes, and he's doing all sorts of Scablands work, kind of changes part of the story. Thank you, Brian, from Portland for the last-minute email. Yes, Brian, great-grandson of this guy. Well, so then Glenn's at it. Uh, again, Glenn's you can imagine Glenn, like, ready to turn in for the night. Saturday night, he'll tune in to watch us live. I'm sure Glenn's still with us. Glenn from Spokane, Google Earth by Glenn. I mean, what does Glenn do at, like, 7.30 last night? He fires up the computer, puts the green visor on, he's ready to go, and it's just chomping away. And so Glenn not only makes KMZ files, which is under Brett's for you, which I just slapped on there right before I came in here this morning, so I hope I did it right. So there's new Google Earth by Glenn files, KMZ files, for Pardee's work that Brian emailed last night. Plus there's the, the My Maps thing that's down below. And Glenn also took the time to email me and Brian a couple of his thoughts. Attached are the KMZ files for all the Joseph, quote-unquote, fine day Pardee visits in this area. This is Glenn from Spokane talking. I put his 1920, 1921, and 22 travels all in the same file. And given that he did very little recording and actual field observation, I went ahead and put the towns where he went through as stops so we could get a feel for where he was traveling and looking out the window of his Ford truck. Okay, so he had a truck apparently. He wasn't taking the train in 1920. Glenn, uh, kind of interesting. Where Brett's, where, sorry, where Pardee drove, he saw lots of upper scablands, and he went to Dry Falls. I wonder what he thought caused that little dry waterfall in 1920. For a guy who was supposed to be looking for Lake Missoula, he sure was spending a lot of time here in the Scablands. I was really surprised to see how much ground he covered. I wonder how he was reporting these trips when he got back to Washington, D.C., and his bosses were asking if he saw anything while out in Washington. It appears he was driving an old Ford truck rather than riding the train. Pardee was here in June of 22, and Brett's came in August. Apparently, Thomas Large takes frickin' everybody to Spantops Large and Pardee drove to Sprague on June 25, 1922. 
So thank you, Glenn, yet again. I, mean, I said Glenn was out of control in the last show. What, what's one step above out of control? I don't know. But it's damn exciting. We're finishing with the bang. We're not finishing with a whimper. This is just surprise number one. And uh, Glenn goes on by spent three. So, so by 1922, Glenn reports, Pardee spent three summers in eastern Washington and had seen much of the same country as Brett's, the same Scablands, the same Dry Falls, Grand Coulee, Waterford, Palouse. This is, come on, g- give Glenn a break now in case he's off on this. This is just after like three hours of total immersion late on a Saturday night. He was still talking glacial streams as the cause. I'm now really surprised that he did not back Brett's up at the ambush meeting in 1927. Other than his bosses were doing the piling on and he didn't want to get into that food fight. And perhaps he was told to sit in the back of the room and shut up. Here's a mashup Google My Maps of Brett's and Pardee. That's what's waiting for you down below. Enough for tonight. Okay. So this is what it looks like. So the green are Brett's. This of as of last night, all these peas are Pardee's field sites. Pardee got around, man. And it was always a mystery where Pardee went and what he saw. And again, he never really published on this stuff. Outside of like one little abstract and then some buried thing in the, the police problem paper with, 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 with Bryant. <laughs> but wait, there's more. We're still on surprise number one. Glenn saw some of you in the live chat in the last show say, hey, Glenn, can't you put LIDAR into Google Earth? I think you can do that, or words to that effect. And so after midnight, so now we're just a few hours ago, Glenn in Liberty Lake, Washington, is somehow getting LIDAR into his Google Earth and making those files. Those are also under Brett's at nickzentner.com. Enter the promo code GLEN for 10% off. And I, I barely glanced at these, but uh, this seems like a whole nother world that Glenn has opened up to us. Elaine in Tucson says, holy crap, uppercase. I mean, we got, what do we have? We got Brett's field notes superimposed on LIDAR. I don't even know where we are. Oh, here's Athole. (laughs) So, Glenn, I think you deserve more than a mug. I don't know what you deserve, but you get an attaboy at least. Thank you, Google Earth by Glenn. Thank you, Glenn. Seems like an understatement at this point. But there's another surprise. And I can't remember how I laid this one out, so let me get us started doing this. Oh, no. Let's just see what I did by slide first. Right. Okay. So surprise number two is a big one. How do I do it? I've commented the whole winter that this community of viewers has been incredible and much, not just a couple things, much of what we have done this winter is a direct result of the discoveries of the viewers and the time and energy put in by the viewers. And you might recall one of the early gets or one of the early victories produced by the viewers was contact information for the Brett's family. I think it was episode A. At the end, I said, I need somehow to get connected with a living descendant of J. Harlan Bretz. And I eventually owned up that I needed that information, if I could find somebody, to get permission to share the journals from the University of Chicago. Well, I wouldn't have been able to connect with the great-grandson of J. Harlan Bretz if it wasn't for the viewers. So thank you yet again. 
So all through the winter, I've been checking in with the great grandson, and I, I don't want to give you his name or location or anything, but um, I've been checking in. And I've mentioned this more than once to you, that I have an interview with Brett's son, Rudolph Brett's. And I shared this once with you before, but Rudy Bretz, Rudolph Bretz, the only son of J. Harlan Bretz, was a influential educational video producer, a film producer. He lived in Hollywood. He did a bunch of publishing of educational books, educational research through much of his life. And he was a very, very well-known person in that world. Rudolf Bretz we're talking about. So let's have the slides do the rest of the talking. Maybe you can see what's about to come. So one of our discoveries was that we found the brand new house that was built. Yeah, the pilot. Uh, Don, thank you. We found the house that Brett's built in Seattle, Washington uh, during the first year that J. Harlan Bretz was teaching geology at the University of Washington. And the home was built, presumably, with the thought that Harley and Fanny would raise their family in this house and there would be a long life based out of this house in Seattle. And again, viewer help got us to realize that we know the address of this house, and the house is still standing. Remember this? This was before Christmas. And you might remember that we even, like, zoomed in on Google Maps and we Google Street View, and we saw this cute little tack-on to presumably the original siding of the house built by J. Harlan Bretz. Well, how did we find the street address, ultimately? How did some of the viewers find the street address for this house? It wasn't easy. Well, the spies found a birth certificate. Do you remember? And it was the birth certificate of Rudolf Bretz, born on July 12, 1914. Here's the address of this house. And I think about a month after Rudy was born, the first child of Jay Harlan and his wife Fanny, they moved to Chicago because things didn't work out at the University of Washington. So to finish the story, I'm about to play you some video clips. An interview of Rudolf Bretz back in the 1990s, just a few years before he passed away. And the reason that I mentioned connecting with the great-grandson, and therefore the grandson of Rudy, is that I wondered if I could share this interview with you. And the great-grandson, all through the winter, said, uh, thanks for asking. I really like what you're doing, and I was happy to give you permission to share those field notes from the University of Chicago. But I think we want to keep the Rudy stuff in the family. And I said, I, I respect that. Thank you. He said, I might change my mind, but for now, I, I think we, we just want to hang on to it. And we appreciate the interview. We hadn't seen the interview before. So I check in every three or four weeks, just checking in how are things going. You enjoying the series? And, and the great grandson said, uh, I, I actually invited the great grandson to be here with us on Sunday live for Z. He said, Well, I don't think I'm comfortable with that either, but thank you. And then at 5:30 yesterday morning, I emailed the great the grandson, the great grandson one more time. And I said, thank you one more time 
for the permission to share all these journals and all these notes. It's been a huge part of this winter. And I have just one more idea I have to run by you. We just had an interview with Richard Waite, who was at, in the room, in Malibu, when that interview was done with your grandpa, Rudolph. And I talked off camper with, camera with Richard, and Richard said it was the most amazing thing that listening to your grandpa, Rudy, speak was exactly like listening to Jay Harlan Brett speak. The same cadence, the same rhythm, the same pattern, the same tone, everything. Rudy talked exactly like his dad, Harley. And so yesterday morning I said, I know you don't want to be on camera, great-grandson, and I know you don't want me to share the interview, but I would just thought I'd let you know that some of the viewers thought that if we could somehow get a hold of the J. Harlan Brett's nationwide radio broadcast from 1932, we could sample that radio broadcast and convert it using AR and then eventually, possibly, and I, like I am fond of saying, I was typing, I don't really know what I'm talking about right now. <laughs> but I said there's an AI angle to this that if we could get your, if we could get Jay Harlan's Brett's uh, voice, then AI could kind of bring these field notes to life. And I said, what would you think if on the episode Z, I just played about a minute worth of Rudy's voice, just without the video, just the audio. Would you be okay with that? I don't want to push it. It's okay if you say no. And the great grandson said, with about two hours later, yesterday about noon, he said, I've been giving this a lot of thought. I've enjoyed the series, and I like the AI angle. And I think if you could somehow take Rudy's voice and sample it somehow and animate it to the point where then ultimately these old field notes could be read in J. Harlan Bretz's voice, that would be magnificent. You go ahead and share whatever you want in that interview with Rudolph Bretz. And he went on to say, here's three little segments that I think are particularly good, where Rudy is talking about Harley's um, teaching methods. And so I have honored the great-grandson's request by grabbing those segments. And I'm going to put my headphones on and give you a chance to travel back in time to the 1990s in Malibu, California, listening to the son of J. Harlan Bretz, who was then thinking about being on field trips with his dad, J. Harlan Bretz, in the 1920s. And you're like, how did I get this interview uh, back in the fall of 2019, right before the pandemic? These two guys caught wind that I was working on some Brett stuff and both Charlie and Mark took the trip over here to this office and gave me some of these high eight tapes and I got them converted to digital form. Um, and so thank you to Charlie and Mark, essentially early viewers of the viewing community. And th these guys might be with us today. I don't know. Here's the email from the great grandson yesterday about noon. Hi, Nick. I have indeed changed my mind. You are welcome to use the Rudy Brett's interview in episode Z. Feel free to select selections as you see fit. One theme that is discussed three different times in the video is that of J. Harlan Brett's teaching style as using the Socratic method. This is mentioned at 730, 1915, and 2450 in different contexts. I like your idea of using AI to recreate Harley's voice Although, as you say, it would require a sample, which I don't currently have. Without further ado, here we go. Well, what my dad did in one of his early years, instead of going out alone, I think he did that a couple of times out of the uh, Columbia Plateau in Washington. The um, third time he went out, I think it was, he decided to take the family along, make a family touring trip out of it, camping trip. And he equipped uh, 
the car that we had at that time, which was a four-cylinder 1924 Dodge um, sedan, and uh, we became uh, a uh, self-contained uh, living unit, the four of us, my sister, was three years younger than me. I was 10 at the time, she was seven. And uh, dad and I sat in the front seat. The mother and dad, mother and the daughter sat in the back seat. And we kind of managed to cover maybe 300 miles a day on the way west. And it got to be routine. We did this at least four summers, maybe it was more. As a family, going along with him out to his uh, 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 geology work. Of course, we didn't go climbing up hills and uh, across coolies and so forth with him. We generally stayed in the whatever tourist camp it was that we'd found. It was a nice place, especially if it was on a river or something where the kids could go swimming. And uh, he and uh, the students would go out uh, during the day and come back uh, in the evening. Sometimes we'd have campfires and that sort of thing. So it was great for us. It was a marvelous experience for kids of that age. Yeah, did he talk? I got three more clips. He scared his students to death. <laughs> Some of them. If you if you had it, you got along with him fine. If you didn't have it, you were in real trouble. Because uh, he had a way of teaching which has been described as Socratic. That is, by asking questions rather than help. He never told, he never stood up and lectured and gave information. He didn't feel that was a good use of his time in front of the class. He had the class use the medium of the book and read the book prior to class, and then he spent his time in class discussing it and getting the students to discuss it back and forth. He'd ask a question, he'd get an answer, and then he'd ask if anybody disagreed with the answer, and he'd get an argument going in, in class, and he had everybody paying attention. If he didn't have them paying attention, they were in trouble. One, one student told me, you'd never forget the time that my dad caught him looking out the window. <laughs> So sort of, uh, uh, sort of like the professor that, uh, you know, the apocryphal professor who uh, lectured away and lectured out a question and then stopped and walked down the aisle and pointed his finger and said, you, he would be delighted to, to catch somebody who didn't know the answer to a question and uh, tease it out of him uh, in some way so that the guy would make a, a stupid mistake or say something which was ridiculous and you point out uh, um, you know, get someone else to point out how ridiculous it was and then he would hold that over that student for the rest of the, of the uh, class of the uh, course. And of course, every time the subject would come up he would say, well, Mr. So-and-so would say this and give a crazy answer which would get a laugh and he did, would milk that for uh, all it was worth. And the result was that if you had it, if you knew what you're talking about, you would get along just fine. And if you didn't know, you were in terrible trouble. And there were there were people who quit the class. There were students who just uh, couldn't take it. They were uh, ridiculed. Sarcasm was his greatest weapon. But those those who uh, managed to survive uh, were ones that. Uh, uh, sang his praises forever. And I heard so much about what a tremendous teacher he was and how inspiring he was and how much uh, you could learn by uh, talking with him or uh, listening in Edison's classes and being a part of it that I decided I would have to take one of his courses. So I signed up for uh, uh, historical geology. And <clears throat> I started out on one side of this thing, where I didn't know something one time, and I said I, I saw myself getting into real trouble. And of course, I he was probably leaning over a little backwards because I was his own son. He wasn't. I have anybody say that he was being uh, partial in any way. So I was lucky that I had a free period just before his class, and I got up 
that book, and I read that book so thoroughly. The portion that is going to be discussed uh, each day, I was right fresh on, and I knew exactly uh, what I would be talking about. I managed to get through it all right with a decent grade, but uh, it was an experience that I'm very glad I had. Two more short clips. Um, three or four students with him uh, uh, each summer trip. And uh, what he did with the students was to incorporate them into his thinking so that uh, he, was, he was not trying to teach them anything except as they would learn by observation. And he was allowing them to observe his thinking by incorporating them into it. In other words, he would say, what do you think of this? And uh, oh, this looks like that. And uh, um, in, involve them in contributing to the thinking about what he saw. I also remember that um, his mode of, of operating was uh, to spend the day um, in tramping over the uh, countryside, the climbing the particular hills where he, he needed to know uh, the, uh, he needed the data of observation. And then we would go and have uh, dinner in some cafe. And after dinner, we'd ask if we couldn't just uh, stay there in the booth and we'd sit down, clear the table, and spend uh, an hour or two in the evening uh, writing up notes. And uh, he, that's at the point where he would write his uh, field notes. And uh, as soon as your field notes were finished, uh, uh, <clears throat> then we'd go uh, have some rest. And Yeah. So thank you to the great-grandson Thank you to Rudy for sitting down before the cameras. And uh, I have 35 minutes of that. And I think I will post at some point this week that 35 minutes, if you like that sort of thing, uh, on the YouTube channel. Uh, but those are just a few little tastes of what we have. Well, yet another way to revisit Brett's and visit Brett's for the first time to be totally honest. A couple final things, and I think we're wrapping up for today. Beautiful photos to put us right back there. First-hand accounts. Rudy's probably part of this group as a teenager. And we're starting to realize that, yes, we've come a long way in visiting Brett's at different stages of his life. Here's Brett's in his last few years. I've showed you this picture before, Vic Baker, visiting him in the 1970s. This is the house that Brett's built and lived in most of his life, not in Seattle, but in Homewood, Illinois, in the greater Chicago area. And I'm sorry, there's the address, 2114 Cedar Road. And it is, uh, as somebody mentioned, I forget who, uh, maybe Scott Burns mentioned, it's an Airbnb. You can go stay in Brett's house if you want. Uh, and the house back in the 1923 cost uh, th a little more than $3,000 to build. And this is the interior, I guess, taken off of the Airbnb listing. I'm not really sure who sent me these photos. Thank you, though, whoever did. This is back uh, last summer, I think, I was asking for details about this. So here's the staircase that Brett's would go up and down every day. This is where Richard Waite went up to spend the night, if you remember from the last episode. And uh, the Brett's home in Illinois. So yeah, Flint, Brett's, many characters. In his old age memories, Here's a couple of uh, specific things from Brett's as he was writing up those memories uh, a few years before his death. J. Harlan Brett's, I am reminded of another man deeply concerned about his standing among other specialists in his line. 
and an early remark of his, my career is at stake, revealed his ambitions. In the Yale department, he was known for excessive blowing of his own horn, so much so that I received a letter from the head of his department, noting that in terms of years, he was due for a promotion, and asking four questions of me, J. Harlan Bretz, three of which I answered affirmatively, but the fourth I had to answer no. It was, would you be willing to have him a member of your field party you might be directing? I noted that personal maladjustments had been reported to me from an Arctic voyage. Yes, came the answer of his chief, so have we, but we are hoping that the leopard may change his spots. Flint got the promotion at Yale. Later, I would have given two no's to the four questions. The query was to the effect, did I consider that his field interpretations were valid and untainted by personal feelings? That came after his publication of a series of erroneous interpretations of Washington Scabland, a publication that I tore to pieces in 1956. He really later admitted his mistakes by dropping the entire topic in the second edition of his compendium. I am sure that he would like to forget that he ever published his interpretation of the Chini Palouse Gabland. I have more evidence from some of his students that bears out my two negatives. Yet, like Romer, he has attained a prominent place in his specialty and his hubris gratified. Also from Bretz's old man memories, when the International Geological Congress met in the United States in 1965, field trips both before and after the two-day sessions were on the agenda. Gerald Richmond was to be the leader of a two-day bus trip across the northern, northern Rocky Mountains on the Columbia Plateau in Washington. The plateau part of the itinerary was primarily to, something of the, to see something of the Scabland. Jerry strongly urged me to join this trip. I was pleased to know of such a proposed field trip, but physical deterioration had gone too far even then to justify my participation. I knew that I would be a drag on them, perhaps worse, and that Jerry and George Neff could do as much for the group as I could possibly do. For Richmond had already established, chiefly by soil profiles, that Lake Missoula had had three existences, and Neff had been with me on a previous summer in the Grand Coulee and Quincy Basin. With deep regret, I declined. But I asked Jerry Richmond to plan on places and two busloads for the ghosts of eight geologists who earlier had denied my Spokane flood, now the Lake Missoula flood, explanation for the Chabland, Scabland of southern eastern Washington. They had all died before my final vindication and gone to the great beyond with a totally incorrect concept. They were Alden, Bryan, Hobbs, Leverett, Mansfield, Merriam, Meinsner, and Smith. My vindication had come bit by bit from the field investigators of Richmond, Maldi, Trimble, Waters, Neff, Smith, and others, geomorphic geologists who had seen enough and in sufficient detail. I won't crowd the ghostly passenger list by naming supporters of my interpretation, such as Fenneman, Davis, Rich, Bowman, Blackwelder, etc., who had also entered the heavenly mansion reserved for geologists. I'll leave it to them to argue out with the skeptic ghosts returning from the bus trip. But I must tell you about the telegram I received the day after the two bus loads completed their trip across the plateau. There were 32 participants from 19 countries. I have added a title to the telegram, viz. QED. It consisted of, quote, greetings and salutations, end quote, and closed with the words, quote, we are now all, we are all now catastrophists. We are all now catastrophists, end quote. A letter I found in the Brett's archives sent in September of 1978 from Vic Baker, who was also part of this series. Dear Doc, next month my travels will again bring me through Chicago, and I'll be arriving at O'Hare around 7 p.m. I do not need to fly out until 6 the next day. Can we get together again in that period? A matter that I would like to discuss with you next month is a book that I am preparing entitled The Spokane Flood, A Model Catastrophe. The book will reprint some of the original papers on the development of ideas surrounding the channeled Scabland story. In essence, 
it will be an extended version of Chapter 1 in the channeled Scablin. I'm working out the outline now in anticipation of seeing you next month. Best wishes, Vic. And this handwritten account from Aaron Waters, who we introduced in the last episode, September 8th, 1978, sent from Santa Cruz. This is written by Aaron Waters. Dear Jay Harlan, thank you very much for sending me a copy of Baker and Newman Dahl's fine book on the Scablands. It is nice to see that they give credit where credit is due to the man who walked the very hundreds of miles and made the countless accurate observations that put the whole thing together. Today, with the stunning satellite pictures, abundance of paved roads, and outstanding cuts made by dam builders, irrigation engineers, and road builders, the documentation they have given was easy to get. Not so when you engaged in the hard physical labor that made your documentation possible. To me as a country kid who grew up in the, on the Waterville Plateau, it is a delight to see that this later work, supported by floods of NASA and NSF dollars, and supplemented by photographs, maps, and ease of travel, has done little to document, but a great deal to confirm the, pi the hypothesis, the no proof, that you offered equipped with little more than a pair of sturdy legs and a particularly agile and observing mind. Dollars and what they buy are never equivalent to what a brilliant mind and determination will do. Yours is the glory, and I salute you. Best wishes, Aaron Waters. And who did the red underlining? J. Harlan Bretz himself. House cleaning before we wrap up the series. There's all sorts of documents. Rudolph, we salute you. The Hobbes paper, which I put in the last episode, Hobbes replaced Russell at the University of Michigan in 1906, and Hobbes, in old age, thought that he had evidence for a major scabland glacial lobe covering most of eastern Washington. Thomas Large was not a fan. Bretz was not a fan. And the last few letters between Hobbes, sorry, between the last two letters... The last scraps of correspondence between Bretz and Large involved a discussion of Hobbes. This old map of the state of Washington in 1960, 1960 still has the Mondovi horseshoe and an ice margin south of Spokane. 1960. This guy I didn't post, but I think I can find a digital copy and put on it. It's basically another outreach type of a document published in 1959 by Bretz, not based on any new field work now, but just a repackaging of his work in 1952. Marty Katz was a longtime neighbor of mine. Marty Katz introduced Brian Atwater to the Channel Scablands in the early 1970s. And Marty Katz gave me a bunch of his stuff before he passed away. Uh, some of you know this document uh, published in 1976. Still got the ice to Spokane coming down the Rathrum. Uh, a couple of you sent me this book. Thank you. Uh, here's a portrait of Brett's, maybe at his retirement, I'm not sure, in the 1940s. The question about do floods excavate and then deposit all in the same event? Or is the excavation much earlier than deposi deposition was dealt with in a very uh, beautiful way by Fred Jones with drawings by Charles Zach. I did a video in the Grand Coulee in May using this, but I just love these cartoons from this book called The Grand Coulee From Hell to Breakfast copyright 1947 
So we touched on a little bit of this today. But the Grand Coulee and Dry Falls and the excavation of the Coulee, there remain major questions, surprisingly major questions that continue to this day. It hasn't all been figured out yet. It never will all be figured out. Thanks to John Sonickson for getting me started thinking about Brett's in a new way with this book that I read on a trip with Liz down to Mexico in 2018. And if we're really talking about the last time that Brett's had something in print, it's a little introductory piece into this 1978 book. And this is the one that everybody's thanking Brett. So Brett's got a bunch of copies of this and started just sending them to everybody including Richard Waite and others. But in the very front of this book is uh, a little two-page introduction by Bretz himself shortly before he passes away. But the last paper that's of note in 1969, this is the one that had 24, two dozen major unsolved problems that Bretz enunciates, talking to future workers in the scab land, including glaciation at the channel heads, which I read to you a few weeks ago. I'm going to read again to you right now. I.J. Harlan Bretz believed, past tense, that the till deposits and subdued moraine-like forms on that part of the Columbia Plateau between Spokane and Columbia Rivers on the north and the heads of the Cheney, Palouse, and Telford Crab Creek channels in the south recorded glaciation almost up to the channel heads. Flint also saw the areas glaciated. Richmond has dismissed this view in 1965 and sees the tract as flood swept. But the total lack of isolated residual hills of Luce, so prominent a feature of flood erosion elsewhere on the plateau, seems to argue for glacial rather than flood removal. Perhaps both events occurred, glaciation before flooding. So since Christmas, we've been asking what the hell happened to the Spokane ice sheet. I think Jerry Richmond decided we're going to take that thing off. We're going to take that Spokane ice sheet, that older ice sheet, we're going to get it out of there. And this spring, we'll continue to poke around over there, making videos and talking to whomever wants to talk geologically. And we'll continue to ask ourselves, was Jerry Richmond correct in removing that ice history from the city of Spokane? Jay Harlan Bretz, we salute you. And I salute you all, dear friends for being part of this session and all of these sessions, the Ice Age Floods, A to Z. So, are we done? We're done. Past the three-hour mark? Sure. Uh, am I going to be done with the Ice Age Floods? No, I'm going to continue thinking about the Ice Age Floods uh, through the spring. And let me share with you a few of the reasons that I will continue to have that on the brain. Tom Foster, photograph, Palouse Canyon. So here's one reason that I will continue to think about the floods for the next couple of months. As I announced early in the alphabet, but I'm reminding most of you, I'm going to be doing three brand new lectures on the floods and Brett's based on all of our discoveries together this winter. And if you're unaware of this, you are welcome to come to Ellensburg physically. The fourth, the fifth, the sixth, three lectures in a row. Each of these lectures will be different. Here's the address. The place is called Morgan Auditorium or the Morgan Performing Arts Center. In beautiful downtown Ellensburg, there's 700 seats. Open seating, no tickets. 
It's free to anybody that wants to come. It will be recorded. It won't be broadcast live, but those three lectures will be filmed and posted on my YouTube channel. So some of you have been here before. These are where I do the downtown lectures as of late at the Morgan Performing Arts Center. And here's what it looks like inside. There's about 500 seats on the main floor. And there's another 200 seats in the balcony. So there's about 700 seats total. And you're like, why would I come to watch something that's going to be posted on YouTube? OK, yeah, right. Why bother? You're going to see it on YouTube after the thing's recorded and I upload it onto my YouTube channel. Right. Well, I don't know how many are going to come. Last winter when we did this, I was very nervous there would be way too many people that showed up. And so I was very, very hush-hush about it. And I only announced it here. And, you know, there's 700 seats. And I think there were like 400 people. There was like 300 empty seats. So I'm less cautious this year about announcing this. I still don't think I'm going to do major publicity or whatever. But uh, I think the main reason people want to come is that they, they want to meet other people who are in the live chat. Like that was a fascinating thing last year to see everybody talking to each other like they were old friends, even though they'd met for the first time. And yeah, there were people coming in from a long way away. And that's the reason I'm doing three lectures in three nights, because some people are coming from a long way away, and I, I want them to be able to be able to go to something more than just a one-hour lecture. So there'll be three one-hour lectures. And how will I do it? How will I take all this whole alphabet and get it down to three new lectures I don't know, but I got a couple months to think about it. So that's the Morgan Auditorium. Uh, I filmed other downtown lectures there before. That's the, that's the venue we're talking about. So one more time, you can free, you can pause this video and replay and, and jot this down if this is new to you. Uh, but I, I want to stay out of any kind of arrangement. So, you know, I'm not going to be, there's no tickets, there's nothing arrangement. I can't reserve a bunch of seats for you or whatever. It's just, you know, festival seating. Just the, there'll be ushers there. They'll open the doors at 6.30, and, and uh, they'll take good care of you. I think also this spring, um, since I'll be thinking about the floods, I want to go back to doing some of this, teaching in the field with people who want to visit with me out in the Scablands. And I played with this idea of pop-up geology in the past, and it worked. But I was also so busy with my own phone and microphone and streaming and finding three bars and Verizon and Starlink and all that. Uh, I think I have a new plan. At least for this spring, I think I'm going to do it in a kind of a, a slightly altered version of pop-up geology. I like the idea that when I check the weather, the weather looks good, it's nice and sunny, it's calm, whatever, it's springtime. I like the idea that I get on my YouTube channel uh, and, and put a little uh, announcement video that's five minutes long. And I say, hey, what are you doing on Thursday at noon? Here's a pin on a Google Maps. Uh, put it in your phone. I'll see you at noon at this spot and we'll get together and bring a camp chair and we'll just have a little party out there in the, in, in the middle of nowhere. I like that. So I'm going to do some of those pop-up geology things. But what I'm not going to do is try to film them live. That was just too much of a hassle for me. It took away from my enjoyment. It added a level of whatever that I don't want to have to deal with. I just want to visit with people, do a little bit of stuff at one spot, it's just a lecture out in the middle of a field somewhere. It's not a field trip. It's not five stops. It's nice and easy. I meet people at a designated location at a designated time. I give a little talk for an hour, answer a bunch of questions, shake a few people's hands, just get to know a few people I've never seen before, and then we all go our separate ways. And I don't know, if somebody in the crowd wants to film it or whatever and then give me the file, that'd be fine. But otherwise, it'll just be kind of retro in that way. That's my thinking, and I don't know how many times I'll do that, but I'd like to do that. I'm not teaching Geology 350. 
So I'm not teaching Geology 351 this spring. So I won't be live streaming any lectures or, or classes or anything. Uh, I'm going to have a varied schedule this spring. But doing occasional pop-ups uh, will be part of it. Also, um, this May, May 15th to the 17th, you've heard reference to it a number of times, uh, the Geological Society of America is having a joint Cordilleran and Rocky Mountain section meeting in downtown Spokane, based out of the Davenport Grand Hotel. And Chad Pritchard at Eastern Washington University is uh, running the meeting and putting it together. Kelsey Stanton, who is part of this series, is, uh, I think, the field trip coordinator. And I'm mentioning this. Uh, I don't know if, if it's easy for the public to attend. And even if the public is, uh, if it's possible for the public to attend, I'm sure there's a charge. So I'm just letting you know there's a GSA meeting happening in Spokane. Um, I'll, yeah, a bunch of, bunch of the folks in the series will be there. But I, I don't think we have any plans for any sort of public anything. Same thing here, I guess. Thomas Large started the Northwest Scientific Association back in the 1920s. And shortly after the GSA meeting in Spokane, there's the Northwest Scientific Association meeting held on the campus of Gonzaga. Uh, if you're interested in attending these, I don't know if that's open to the public or if they charge or what the process is. Not my thing. One of the main speakers is Richard Waite. So, yes, 94th annual meeting of the Northwest Scientific Association. And as I mentioned, uh, geologists are kind of popping up out of nowhere, including Mike McCollum, who's been sending some photos about the Excelsior gravels, which was the stuff that both Brett's and Flint thought was old glacial till. So. There's a bunch of these photos waiting for you at nickcentner.com. I'm filming a new batch of episodes for the PBS series called Nick on the Rocks. And since I've been thinking so much about the Ice Age floods, I think at least a couple of them will be filmed out in the Scablands this spring with a very talented filmmaker named Brady Lawrence. Uh, this is a screenshot from the Spokane, uh, excuse me, the Moses Cooley episode that we filmed last spring, and uh, very pleased with that one, as I mentioned before. Uh, finally, I'd like to um, remember the main guy who got me interested in the Ice Age floods, and I talked about him in session A, so this is kind of a bookend here where I'm talking about him again as we finish the series. Uh, Tom's been gone now for four years, uh, but I think he would have enjoyed this series, even though he never would have been wanted to be on camera or anything. He would have, he would have uh, enjoyed many of our sessions. And the Ice Age Floods Institute is now hosting Tom's website uh, to make sure that it stays open for business. But there's nobody better than Tom Foster there was nobody better than Tom Foster for taking photographs to show places like this, the channeled scablands in the, Grand, in the Columbia River Gorge, where we have the lower half of the gorge at Celilo, scoured heavily, and then the upper hills unaffected by the floods. So Tom Foster, this is more than a decade ago now, Tom Tabbert, who used to fly the ultralights with us making episodes. So that... I don't think I would have gotten to this point with doing an Ice Age Floods series if I hadn't have gotten a very firm introduction to all these concepts through this one-man wrecking crew, Tom Foster, who taught himself everything and was miles ahead of all of us with Joseph Pardee and all the history. And so much of what I did this winter was Tom was talking about 15 years ago, and I, I was too immature to, to even listen to what he was talking about. And so, yeah, we were focusing on the Ice Age floods with our first little video series, but we expanded, and I started bringing the chalkboard out into the field and 
the collaboration with Tom Foster was a very rich experience. And uh, that experimentation continues. And my commitment to making everything free and available to all is a direct result of working with Tom. Tom was a huge proponent of that approach. So thank you, Tom Foster. Okay. A toast to you. Here's to you for joining us today. Here's to you for being part of our whole series this winter, the Ice Age Floods A to Z live stream series. Here's to our three guests today, Jerome Lessman, Sky Cooley, and Joel Gombiner. Nice effort today, fellas. Really thought that went well. Thank you. I was less nervous about that than I was the last few Zoom sessions from technology and everything else, so that was easy for me. And I uh, hope you all enjoyed that as well. Speaking of thanking guests, can I thank all the guests uh, in order of appearance this winter? Quickly, please. In order of appearance, Jerome Lessman, Nanaimo, British Columbia, Sky Cooley, Mission Valley, Montana, Joel Gombiner, Seattle, Washington, Glenn Cruikshank, Liberty Lake, Washington, Kelsey Stanton, Spokane, Washington, Jim O'Connor, Portland, Oregon, Mark Sweeney, Vermilion, South, Der South Dakota, Vic Baker, Tucson, Arizona, Larry Smith, Butte, Montana, Sean Wilsey, Twin Falls, Idaho, John Schellenberger, Toppenish, Washington, Scott Burns, Tualatin, Oregon, and Richard Waite, Vancouver, Washington. Here's a toast to all those geologists who gave freely of their time and interest into what's going on here with us. Thank you, everybody. I love you. And thank you yet again for all of your love and participation with this winter's live stream series. Will there be another one next winter? Yeah. I like the format. Will it be on the Ice Age floods? Nope, I'll be on to something else by then. I got a few things up my sleeve. But for now, the Ice Age floods are in the book, and I'll continue to think and follow all these leads that many of you have provided in the last few months. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye from Ellensburg, Washington, USA. He loves and she loves and they love, so won't you love me and I'll love you. Birds love and bees love and whispering trees love, that's what we both should do. I always knew someday you'd come along. We make a twosome that just can't go wrong, darling. 
He loves and she loves and they love, so won't you love me like I love you? Oh, mm-hmm.